Good morning to all of you. First, I would like to convey our World Social Day wishes to all the persons who are before me and all the participants who are listening to this webinar. 
and we convey our greetings from Periyar Mani Main University Department of Social Work. And this international symposium is on strengthening social solidarity and social work intervention. And we are very proud to inform you that we have almost 348 uh, registered participants coming from almost six countries. And it is indeed a great pleasure for you, for us, to inform that we have seven resource persons, all stalwarts in their field, in different fields of social work, both academic and practitioners, who has given their concern to be with us today and deliver their special addresses. So in this regard, uh, I would like to welcome all of you and a special note of uh, welcome to our Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor who has given his concern uh, to be the uh, person to inaugurate this uh, international symposium and give a special address. Uh, we are very much grateful to you sir for all the support you have given to us and being with us today. And uh, with uh, all my gratitude, we welcome uh, our Dean Faculty of Humanities, Sciences and Management, uh, Dr. Leftinal Vichelakshmi uh, Madam, who has been a support for us in organizing this uh, symposium. And I would like to welcome a stalwart in the field of social work from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Professor, Center for Rural Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusion Policy, the most learned person, Dr. Avati Ramaya, who has been a person to give his special address in this inauguration of the International Symposium. I also would like to go fast to welcome all the other speaker, Dr. Abraham Matthew from uh, USA, who is going to give his first session, and uh, uh, Dr. Professor Andrew Sesuraj from Professional Social Workers Association, affiliated to IFSW through INPSWA. Uh, I also welcome uh, Ms. Noni Harris from James Cook University. I also welcome Sori Ibrahim from Mali. I also welcome Timothy Zimba from uh, uh, Malawi. And I also welcome Ivin, our friend from Norway, uh, who is given concern to give a felicitation in the valedictory address. And I also welcome the most learned person, Dr. Steve Hodasal, a stalwart in the field of social work and a great academician from the Edgefield University who has given concern to give a keynote address during the valedictory section. And it is a great moment for us from the Periyar Maniyamai uh, Institute of Science and Technology where Periyar has to be globalized a social reformer, a social thinker who has uh, been an instrumental for many social reforms in the uh, in our country and who has been uh, recognized in various parts of the world. So this is a very big inspiration for us uh, to connect a lot of things. And I uh, last but not least, I want to thank International Federation of Social Workers, IFSW, which is the highest body of uh, social work social workers in the globe, which has co-branded with Department of Social Work, Periyar Manimi, Institute of Science and Technology to conduct this program. And this year's um, um, theme is Ubuntu. Ubuntu is I am because we are. Ubuntu is a word which has really a big inspiration which 
took lot of revolutionary things by our Nelson Mandela. And this has been uh, taken as the theme for this uh, year and strengthening social work, sorry, strengthening social solidarity and global connectedness. So we are very proud to connect globally from various part of the globe as given concern and participating in this program. So I welcome once again all the persons, all the social workers, practitioners, academicians um, and the persons from various fields and I also welcome my own colleagues and my students for this uh, uh, one day international symposium. Thank you very much for that opportunity. Now I request our uh, Honourable uh, Vice Chancellor to uh, Honourable Pro Vice Chancellor uh, to deliver his inaugural address. Thank you, Dr. Honor Gerard Sebastian, in the Department of Social Work. I am extremely happy to participate in this international symposium on strengthening social solidarity and social work intervention. I am doubly happy that this symposium is being put up by an institute, a deemed to be university, which is named after the greatest social revolutionary Tante Periyar, Periyar E. V. Ravasong who is affectionately referred as Tandai Maria among the Tamils or world. I take this opportunity to welcome my good friend Dr. Avati Ramaya, an eminent professor in the field of social work from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, this Mumbai. I also welcome as my colleague Dr. Gordon Gerard Sebastian mentioned that all the participants. This being an international symposium, I am happy to note that participants from almost more than six, seven countries have registered for this very interesting symposium on social work. I understand three hundred and forty each participant has have registered for this international symposium. They know eminent personalities from different fields, from different countries, are going to speak on this topic social solidarity, that is strengthening social solidarity and social work intervention. Today, being the World Social Work Day, 16th March is being celebrated all over the world as a social 
World Social Work Day. I'm happy that Priya Mariamai Institute of Science and Technology has taken the initiative to celebrate this day by organizing an international symposium on the topic, very interesting topic, strengthening social solidarity and social work intervention. This is uh, more appropriate for this university to organize this program. The reason being, Dr. Gerard, in his welcome note, welcome address, mentioned that this university is the property great social revolutionary than the Korea. The university itself has its roots from social justice, humanism. So that is the ultimate goal of the movement which Periyar, Tandai Periyar started his self-respect movement way back in the year 1926. Self-respect movement, it is a root for the humanism. Being human is important for being a social animal. Respect the fellow human being. So that is a message given by Sandeep Pindya. Giving respect to the human being lies the humanism. Great people work for peace, communal peace, tranquility. The reason being that peace has been shattered and sometimes we do not find tranquility in the society. In the name of religion, in the name of caste, in the name of superstition, the name of religious practices, the peace is shattered. That tranquility has given a war. Periyar, Tante Periyar said, eradication of caste, establishing an egalitarian in society lies only by eradicating the caste system. The caste system which is built on the altar of the discrimination. Unless you eradicate caste system, eliminate the system of caste, which is being practiced from time immemorial, it is very difficult to break tranquility among the human being. It is difficult to have peace among the community, therefore, it is important, he said, to eradicate caste. Unless you give education, it is through education. That is the instrument through which we can bring about major revolutions. That to give education to women, the nurses, belief with which throughout his life he was working for the emancipation of women. Women's, women's emancipation is the, is the real social reform, social revolution that was the period. He was totally against the superstitious practices, the customs and manners which is being practiced by several religions. These practices, the manners, divide men from men. Humanism lies only when you remove all these practices, the superstitious practices, the practice of 
observing antiquity which is a very very bad practices which is being practiced in india particularly so he was working against the removal of antiquity eradication of caste system to bring about a society where humanism thrives a community where absolute peace prevails a society where people live in tranquility it was this reason in the year 1970 unesco gave an award to sandeep periya with a citation which i quote the prophet periya the prophet of new age the socrates of southeast asia father of social reform movement and all enemy of ignorance superstitions meaningless customs and base manners that is the citation given by unesco way back in 1970 this university is named after such a great revolutionary and the department of social work is carrying out great social works this university has adopted 67 villages in the vicinity of this university institute and providing various support to grow its students and faculty so we have a separate department called center of rural development which is headed by a very eminent professor a former vice chancellor of mother teresa university dr rajani who is very much available here i welcome professor janak and she is taking all the leads for providing the social services to the villages which has been adopted by this periyar by my institute of science and technology because we don't believe only in simply preaching we believe in practice whatever we practice we preach and whatever we preach we practice so that is the so that is the aim of uh, this great university there is priyar money of my institute of science and technology this was set up in the year 2008 of course it was initially started as a, an engineering college for women whereas the first engineering college offering courses on technology engineering and technology only for women whereas this is the first university an institute or college exclusively set up for providing technology engineering and technology courses for women in the world so 10 years after the establishment of the college it has been evaluated as a deep university now priyal money by science and technology offering courses on engineering technology management science arts education everything it is a huge university it is situated in punjab which is a delta of kaveri and providing educational services to the hamas that is another important milestone of this university providing education being access to those who have not been access to this you know, again education many people in this country were denied access to education that was the reason this university this institution periyar institute of science and technology is set up to provide educational facility to those people who were denied opportunity who were denied access to educations so this is the great 
campus of this university. I take this opportunity to again welcome all the participants here and all the eminent speakers going to make the presentation. Today, I welcome everyone. I take this opportunity to compliment the Department of Social Work headed by Dr. Honors Gerard Sebastian for his excellent work in putting up this international symposium and other teams and the students who are present over here. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I wish this symposium a great success. Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words and the encouraging uh, uh, talk about the social justice empowerment uh, by media and the legacy the institution carry forward for women empowerment and all the aspects which we are doing in the field. I thank you very much, sir, for uh, giving us an opportunity to organize this program and also coming over here. Thank you very much, sir. Now I request uh, our Dean, uh, Humanities, Management and Sciences, to deliver the presidential address. Good morning, gentlemen. On behalf of the Faculty of Humanities, Sciences and Management, first of all, I wish you all a very, very happy World Social Work Day. First of all, I want to appreciate the efforts of the Department of Social Work in organizing such an international symposium of two cells. Why I am insisting this word two cells because there is a trend now because in the COVID-19 period, the moment uh, taking so much of steps, uh, the first step is we have, we have to continue our education. So they have started and they have insisted schools and universities and colleges to take online classes. So on that time, there, is a, there was a trendy to conduct workshops, seminar, quiz, quiz questions in various departments like mathematics, physics, chemistry and other major subjects. But we came, in my experience, I'm feeling uh, that there is only one or two symposiums or workshops and webinar in social media. So in that period also, our university social work department actually participated in social work activities, field work activities in the code like by assisting police department as a voluntary organization. First of all, I want to congratulate or encourage the people for doing such a very good active work in that uh, code field. We come across so many subjects in this manner because social work department only teach that human values, professional ethics, everything. But the students are not concentrating in studying that subjects like uh, social work. But in the world level, there are so many de uh, demands for the uh, social work students, degree holders. So uh, I request all the UG holders, those who are participating in this program, to do PG subjects in social work department. In the world level, there are so many openings for that subject. So in the current in world level, there are so many de departments are organizing, like uh, uh, symposium and everything, but uh, international is not a uh, small task for getting in this uh, short duration uh, our department organizing by combining seven countries in one destination that to itself uh, very very uh, i want to increase that also and uh, next is uh, it is my best wishes to other organizers and students of social work for this program to make a grand success thank you Thank you very much, Madam, for your encouraging words. Um, since our uh, resource person has also joined, who is uh, ready to give his special address, uh, we will uh, go directly for his speech uh, before uh, leaving the floor to our Professor Avati Ramya. I want to introduce him uh, to the audience. Dr. Avati Ramya has been a faculty member at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, Mumbai since July 1991. Currently, he is a professor and chairperson at the Center for Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusion Policy. This, um, he obtained his uh, MA Social Work in 1984 from Loyola College, Chennai. He secured his MPhil Population Studies in 1987 and a PhD in Sociology in 
1999 from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. His academic interests pertain to the broad area of caste and the Delhi development, and he has published extensively in this theme. His publication includes books such such as Law for Dalit Rights and the Dignity, Experience and the Responses from Tamil Nadu, published by Robert 2007, and the contemporary Relevance Ambedkar Thoughts, published in 2017. He was a senior Fulbright scholar at the Department of Anthropology, Columbia University, New York, in 2009. In 2010, he was a visiting faculty at the Will Force Institute for the study of salary and emancipation, University of Hull, UK. In 2013, he was visiting faculty at the Asia Research Center, uh, London School of Economics in 2015. Professor Ramya was a visiting fellow at the Center for the Study of Social System, Jawla Nehru University. He was delivering numerous lectures in India, abroad, in America, uh, in the University of Edinburgh, uh, in the University of London, in the University of Applied Sciences, University of Manchester, University of Bonn in Germany. So, a lot of universities across the globe. On academic pursuit, Professor Ramya has visited other countries as well, including Netherlands, Switzerland, Sweden, Zimbabwe, China, Singapore, and Bangkok. So, it is a great privilege for the Department of Social Work, Bari Armani Institute of Science and Technology, to uh, welcome you, sir, uh, to give you a special address in this international symposium on strengthening social solidarity and social work in the world. Welcome, sir. Over to you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I bring greetings uh, from Tata Institute of Social Sciences to all the faculty, staff, and students of uh, Piri Armaniya Main Institute. And my special thanks to Dr. Devdas, uh, the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University, and to Dr. Gerald and his department colleagues for these uh, kind invitations. Uh, it's uh, I consider it an honor because it is an institute named after uh, Periyar, uh, great rationalist and revolutionaries, a uh, change maker who made his impact in the southern uh, part of India uh, to such an extent that revolution of various kinds became a possibility uh, uh, during his time. Coming um, directly to the the subject uh, of discussion today. The uh, I have tentatively titled as the moral basis of seeking and strengthening social work intervention and social solidarity. I chose this topic because the broader theme of the conference um, is on uh, social work. Uh, um, the theme for World Social Work Day. So, and that theme is something revolves around I am because we are um, strengthening social solidarity and global connectedness. In the website of this uh, World Social Work Day, I also got to read uh, the following statement, which says the social perspective of the interconnectedness of all people and their environment. It speaks of the need for global solidarity and also highlights um, indigenous knowledge and wisdom. I think what is actually considered to be the perspective of social work is indeed very much uh, listed in the list of human rights in the United Nations conventions. If you have a quick glance through of the number of rights listed, uh, under the UN Convention. You'll see the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, especially a few of those things which are very relevant for us, which clearly says all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reasons and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. This first declaration is in fact the form the essence of an Indian constitution. In fact, uh, the essence of almost all constitution, you can say. 
um, according to the Universal Love Declaration, Article 2, which says, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedom set forth in this uh, declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national, um, uh, and so on, including uh, the typical problem that we are confronted with called caste system. Everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of person. All are equal before law. All have the right to property, right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion, right to freedom of opinion and expression. So if you go, if you have, there are numerous uh, rights have been listed there. If you, if you go the spirit of these declarations and the kind of a situation today we are as human species, there's a lot of contradictions. We seem to be far away from these declarations. Probably that is why we still uh, see a lot of truth in what uh, the German biologist Ernst Mayer once said that humans were a biological error. This was his statement. He was a well-known, world-renowned biologist who said humans were a biological error capable of eliminating themselves within 100,000 years. Whereas beetles and other insects are capable of surviving beyond the human species because and that is why the statement said it is better to be smarter than stupid. He has his own doubt about it. Those entities, those species, we call them as stupid, like any kind of insect. They seem to survive for a longer period of time compared to the human species who indulge in all kinds of an activities, probably leading to the elimination of the entire human race. So the danger the human species can cause to its own ray species is immense and it is also evident going by the number of killings taking place all over the world. Today we can say there is no country in the world where there is no mass killing of one group by the another. Almost every country is replete with such instances. We also now get to see lot of instances, every country try to colonize the every other country for whatever reasons, political, for wealth reasons. Every country consistently engaged directly, indirectly uh, in, a, in a way to colonize the other countries for uh, the same reasons of power. So the human race perpetually is under tension, under war, under conflictual situation. We have been under the impression that it is only India that is brutal violence of rape, murder of people called lower caste or Dalits happening. But uh, um, the killing of uh, George Floyd in USA on May 25th, 2020, in a broad daylight by the police, when many other onlookers seeing it, taking it, videos, graphing it, and people also making appeal to this police to stop. The police had the audacity to go on crushing and killing him on the spot. In my opinion, it is these kind of instances tells me that what Ernst Mayer said that human um, is a species is a biological error capable of eliminating itself within 100,000 years and probably the insects will survive an even longer period than what human beings can survive. So, uh, the danger is imminent. We seem to be heading towards a very, very dangerous kind of a situation. Which in a way tells us, today we are talking about solidarity and remain interconnectedness, not only with the fellow species of human beings, but also with the, everything in the, within the environment. It's an ideal thing. I don't want to say that it's an utopian aspiration, but definitely it is an ideal thing towards which every profession should contribute achieving this. But seeing the instances of conflicts 
an ever increasing brutal violence not only in india and many the so called developed nations he seems to give a warning to all of us that unless we change gear the possibility of human race being eliminated by human race itself cannot be ruled out in such a situation what do we expect from a social work professional and social professionals that is the uh, the real change we have as we all know the history and philosophy of social work whether it is in india or in any other country europe and american country the social work had its in its origin a charity as the beginning and charity is linked directly to god devotion and religion so almost every religion says that be kind to others do contribute to the weakest and the needy god will reward you but unfortunately although there is some commonalities in different gods have what different gods have said in different period of time all that different gods have said are not the same well some gods say that god created all human beings equally there are some other god who say god did not create human beings equally they created the money equally the social workers are not those who follow one particular god or a religion we come from diverse religious background so our gods and goddesses are different our worshiping pattern are different so this immediately causes confusion in all of us which god should i follow which god should i not follow we are social work that does not mean we have uh, come out of the prejudices there is also a constant very covered way of holding on to our own faith in a way saying that my god is superior to your god although we are all, we, we all agree that we need to be kind to the poor and the weakest but there is a tendency in all human beings including social workers to say that my god is superior to your god so you listen to whatever my god says not whatever your god says and then you see your god is wise and my god is very kind or vice versa these social workers are those who come from these diverse background actually are really confused which one to follow we say that we follow the western model in all our social practices which gives one kind of a perspective and in both in europe and american context social work did have the beginning through religion and charity was very much part of that beginning of late we begin to realize begin to say that yeah it is not charity we are as professionals we are only to help people to help themselves in a more dignified that is a more dignified way of helping them rather than you continue to be the provider and the other as receiver that is against dignity and whatever we have been doing whatever methods and fields we develop for the purpose have been there for in fact ages as confused social workers it is uh, it is natural that among us a naturally hierarchy gets formed and we tend to identify although we don't spell out there are numerous instances as evidences for it that he is a social worker because he is a christian that is a stereo very strong stereotypes so one good thing probably you say the church means social work means church missionary and so on that is a very strong stereotypes that stereotype is to such an extent that even that way people who believe in that faith are looked down upon sometimes 
with contact. So, we have not broken as professional social workers our linkages to religion and God. I am not advocating we need to break that connection. But the stereotype is there. And in that process, we will say that yeah, yeah, we have been, we have been, we have been uh, spending so much for this community or that community or this service and that service. Are you? Hello, you can mute your mic, please. You can mute your mic, please. Uh, please mute your mic. Sorry. Um, the um, so the stereotype that we are talking about brings some kind of a hierarchy among social workers, in my opinion. Although it is not spelled out, overtly projected, it is there, which is in a way uh, becoming a barrier to remain connected to one another, to build solidarity across religion. So this is, so religion becomes one of the important aspect of challenge to building solidarity across religion. Then, if you go further, within the religion there are numerous varieties, denominations, sects and subsects. Again, brings yet another layer of challenge to solidarity. Then, if you go into specific, for example, I don't want to call it a Hinduism, but I will call it a Brahmanism as a religion. That, that divides people as inferior and superior. So, naturally, Again, there is a scope of some being labeled as Dalit social worker or Brahmin social worker or intermediate caste social worker and so on, so on. It's a very demeaning, it, it is there. It is there very much. The fact that some of the social workers themselves face problem when they are actually engaged in rural development activities, their own identity is questioned by the villagers and probably the treatment is also sometimes very unacceptable. We do come across such instances via data. So, when our ultimate aim is to bring sal build solidarity across villages, across districts, across states, across caste, across communities, across nations, there is a natural need for us to, to at least underplay our social identity and there is a need to associate ourselves with fellow social workers on the basis of some universal ideals. The universal ideals, for example, liberty, for example, equality, fraternity, social justice. These are universal ideals. Although they may have roots in different religions, but these are the universal ideals accepted all over the world. And almost every social worker are supposed to infuse or internalize these, the relevance of these ideals and put into practice wherever, whenever possible in their professional Speak. Now, in order to embrace these universe ideals, naturally this poses the greatest challenge to your own particular identity which is rooted in your own religion and caste or, and gender. The roles have been defined to different communities, different religious groups, different gender on that line. A religion says a Shudra, though capable of accumulating wealth, should not accumulate wealth because it causes pain to a Brahmin. A Shudra, to put in a layman language, is the backward caste. Manuspriti, which is, a, which is a, a script of a particular thing, which says 
A shudra, though capable of accumulating wealth, should not accumulate wealth because it causes pain. No problem. This is also religion. Social worker also belong to this religion. But there are other religions making a similar thing, more or less, on a need. It may not be as brutal as this, but there are utterance of such kinds. Although the magnitude at what, what they can cost to human species is not as dangerous as compared to what I just now said. There is verses in Christianity which supports slavery. So you have, in every way you will find, or if you get the, the radical feminist would argue that in the institution called marriage, women have been given a subordinate role, almost, uh, which is not acceptable. Uh, there, are, there are kinds of things, we don't want to enter into that field, which also can create controversy. The point I am trying to arrive at here, if our ultimate aim is to build solidarity across caste, across individual, across caste, across gender, across religion and nation states and across nations, then there is an urgent, a dire need to elevate ourselves from our primordial identity, identity such as caste and religion and so on, and to elevate ourselves to and universal ideals such as liberty, equality, uh, and fraternity, social justice, and so on. Now, these universal ideals, although sounds very good, they are not that easy to actually uh, implement at every stage. Now, for example, you take liberty. Liberty as a concept has its own meaning which has its own understanding, accepted at the, at the, at the, across countries. But if the same concept of liberty applied to the local norms, the concept, the meaning of the liberty changes. Now, for example, if you take the so-called Hindu society, yeah, there is a liberty to tell us that your liberty is confined to certain things. It cannot go beyond that boundary. And then if you go similarly, the liberty of a Brahmin. A Brahmin alone has the liberty to go nearer to God. And that to bring gender bond. And there is a hierarchy there. So the liberty equality universal ideals, in which in fact constitute the core aspect of the preamble of Indian constitution. The Indian constitution revolves around these universal ideas, liberty of various kind, equality of various kind, social justice as a means to achieve this liberty and equality. And together, we'll be able to achieve what we call it as protest and feeling of uh, togetherness. So our Indian constitution preamble clearly says, we secure our citizens' liberty, equality, social justice, and fraternity, and together, dignity and integrity, unity and integrity of the nations. So, broadly, these are the uh, concepts in our universal, in, in our preamble Indian constitution. Now, if we go by this logic, liberty, equality, and then you compare it with the social work, the core social work values in a way more around this aspect. Unfortunately, it's a different matter that we don't teach social ideals as the foundation of social work profession itself. I don't know what's happening at least as a student of social work at that time. And uh, I have looked at some of the syllabuses of some of the university social work curriculum. These are not the core teaching components of some of these social work uh, uh, curriculum. So, unless these universal ideals are in social work, we say, tend to think that any problem we generally immediately look at as a problem of an individual. We don't look at that as a problem also due to the society. The kind of norms that we set in place, the society set in place, could also contribute to the individual's problems. We don't see that. So, that is the more often approach, we have a clinical approach to every problem. 
and in which we invariably come to the conclusion there is something wrong with that particular individual. Without giving due importance to looking at his surroundings, which could have contributed in a major way to what he is facing today. Much part of our uh, uh, human, uh, in the history of human evolutions, we rely on God, religion for every problem that we confronted with. It took centuries and centuries to realize that the human conditions, good or bad, is something that is a result of his own action and the actions of others around him and also the contribution of nature. To come to this realization, we have taken centuries. And I would still say that still we have not come to that understanding. A vast majority still think that whatever you are today, that it is because of you are God. I am not confronting the faith of the people. But today, interestingly, we have a corona virus. Perhaps most of us don't uh, today believe that maybe praying to God, whichever God, will protect us from corona. We immediately we come to an understanding that no mask is come. Mask is a must. And so much so, even the, the priests are uh, uh, wearing masks. The priests who think that the God is under their control, they are also wearing masks, despite the fact they are all the time near God, but they are also wearing uh, masks. Why I am saying this? Because these, these, these discourse are essential because as social workers we also believe in that. So we need to move very quickly to understand in our, in our problem solving approach, we give much importance to religion and God, in my opinion. I think some amount of rationality and scientific thinking is a must. Uh, otherwise, uh, we leave everything to the mercy of God, which can be a dangerous because we do come to uh, know there are numerous incidents of rape and violence within the premise of uh, worshipping places which uh, many times make us think what God is doing, what religion is doing, what the god men and god women doing, what is the role of social workers there. So a new domain of a new fields of social work to me seems to be emerging. That in that field we need to actually focus bringing in scientific thinking, rational thinking in the people's mind to solve much of our problems. In fact, uh, Article 52, uh, Indian Constitution also has something not only fundamental right, but also has a fundamental duties, which clearly says social harmony, activities that can promote social harmony should be undertaken activity that would promote scientific th and rational thinking uh, should be undertaken. So this is also an obligation, the duties under the same constitutions, which, which, which says that it is the, the responsibility of the state to undertake activities that will promote, infuse uh, rational and scientific thinking, uh, not to just uh, be complacent with the superstitious beliefs which are rampant, especially in our Indian society. So social workers, your aim is to build solidarity. One should be prepared to change gear. One should be prepared to move quickly to more rational and scientific thinking. And, and, and in order to realize that kind of thinking, programs and activities of that kind should be promoted. Social workers with the prejudice of any kind actually are not a social workers, in my opinion. Because they are the people who go to the society and deal with prejudices of various kinds. If they themselves are prejudiced on very men, caste, gender, race, religion, and so on, actually they are not the true social workers, in my opinion. They need to be conscientized, educated first, 
before they are interested in the task of conscientizing, educating others. And, 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 and this is a serious flaw uh, in my opinion, perhaps there has been no attempt on those directions of the basic credentials of a professional social workers. What are the checklists that we have to say a particular person is a qualified to be a social worker or not? We need to have a checklist whether that particular person is come out of prejudice, at least made an attempt to come out of prejudice of one kind or the other. These are, in my opinion, very, very fundamental. So we need to introduce programs, curriculums, which will help not only students, but also teachers to overcome such prejudices. In fact, I would say there should be a, a specialization on dealing with discriminations, um, like, uh, uh, which has a lot of potential uh, across the world, because there is no country which is free from prejudice of one kind or the other. So we, there is also scope for us to uh, uh, move on those directions. Um, uh, before taking much time, I just want to make one or two points and uh, come to an end. Um, I, I, if I feel good about myself, it is because I am with you. In a way, that is also the theme of the uh, International Social Day. If I feel good about myself, I contribute a lot to the people that I am living with. And if I feel bad about myself, that also I contribute to the people that are around me. So, individuals are not made in isolation. Individuals, as he or she is, is made in the environment. That means the personality of an individual depends largely on the people around him or her and the environment. So, unless we take care of the environment, the context in which individuals personality is groomed, probably every individual will turn out to be a, a problematic person to the society. So the, the communitarianist continued to argue that individuals are not important, the community is important. Where the libertarians continue to argue, the individuals are important, not the community. This debate has been going on for centuries. If you Take the words of uh, the architect of the Indian constitution, Dr. Ambedkar. He says, every individual is an important entity in the universe. Fullest opportunity should be given to him to optimize his potential and to optimally utilize his potential for the good of himself, himself and the good of his society. So, if individual liberty has to be sub, uh, cur uh, curtailed, it should be only to the extent to which it can promote his own well-being. Beyond that point, it can be counterproductive. So, while he recognizes individual liberty, for him, the individual's liberty is more important. I think. In, with the process of social workers, what kind of values we can We compromise individual liberty at the cost of community or we compromise the uh, community's uh, liberty at the cost of individual liberty. Then there is need to be a line drawn there somewhere that the individual and the community complement to each other and both are able to grow optimally. I think uh, these, these such things are never taught in social work. That's that's what my my, my problem is. Our our core aim is to build solidarity. When there is absolutely no debate discussion on these lines, which are whether you like it or not, will confront you one day in your own life and invariably will result in some kind of a violence and danger. So um, political thoughts of of various, may often with a contesting perspective, should also become part of the social curriculum. Because we, we tend to think social women, case work, community organization, that's all. 
we are not actually groom in theoretical uh, debate what it means how each theory contributes to the understanding of the society in a different different lens the various lens through which society could be actually captured and what is happening within the society should constitute the core aspect of social work curriculum which is right now in most universities uh, social work curriculum is missing in my opinion i did go through some of the uh, Uh, departments uh, social work curriculum and i i found them completely missing um, so solidarity across communities across nation is the need of the hour peace building is the need of the hour all these things could be possible only when we as social workers are ready to change our own conservative thinking of confining ourselves our thinking only to within our own so called religion and culture we should be in my opinion should be open to look at the other culture other way of living also they have their own importance and we can learn from each other today we are also talking about indian social work indigenous social work uh, these are very welcome thing but then there is it is also has its own danger the indigenous social work indian social work also has a politics behind it why i am saying this a particular kind of social work emerges in a particular context may outlive its utility after some time but if you want to hold down to it even in a context which has no relevance to that particular uh, way of dealing with addressing issues perhaps we are going to be very very regressive in our process of civilization so uh, we should be uh, open to changing ourselves to the changing circumstances and uh, so accordingly we also need to change the social or curriculum approaches maybe new methods of social work should be identified particularly to address the issues of prejudice a uh, new specialization in that field uh, i feel should also emerge so indian social work and indian social workers are a very a very relevant one but the merit of this indian social work and indian social work should be judged on the basis of how this social work is going to expand human freedom how it is going to empower the weak and vulnerable if it is going to further deteriorate or perpetuate with the existing inequalities then that is not the right thing to do that's not at all right thing to do which can be very dangerous too because we want to emerge as a powerful nation not as one community emerging as powerful one religious group emerging as powerful yes. one sub caste emerging as one powerful one gender emerging as part all this can be dangerous we want to emerge as a nation where every individual feels this is my nation because i am protected here i am allowed to grow the way i want in the field i want if that has to actually become that's what the the capability approach of amartya sen reiterate this particular approach again and again very clearly If there are there are various kinds of freedom that he talked about that one important freedom which uh, in my dr ambedkar talked about that he said freedom of mind whether our mind is free to think critically rationally or our mind is already blocked that we are you, you tend to think only in one direction you don't want to see the any other direction because we have been told that is the wrong direction we have already been told that is the wrong direction you as an individual will be able to look at all direction and see judge for yourself what is right and wrong so that is what freedom of mind that freedom of mind seems to be missing because our mind is tuned to think one particular direction within one particular frame framework which actually make us handicap to realize the positive aspect of other line of thinking other framework so the freedom of mind has to be promoted that is why Uh, our constitutive duties 
uh, 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 not only right, the duty is guaranteed under the constitution of promoting scientific thinking have to be relooked and especially exclusive program need to be formulated and implemented. Uh, I, I feel if solidarity has to become a reality, the social workers should be more open and scientific thinking their approach. And come whatever be the challenge, we should be ready to face that. Because in the larger interest of protecting the human species, we need to be open to shifting gears, open to accepting other line of thinking, other way of living. With this uh, uh, note, let me once again thank you for the opportunity given uh, to me to come and address all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Is it audible for you, sir? Thank you very much, sir. Is it audible for you, sir? I am through. Thank you so much. Sir, it's a great uh, uh, yeah, enlightenment which you have given to us, sir, in your speech. Uh, on the topic, the moral basis of seeking and strengthening social work intervention for social solidarity. So this is a, a really a, a very good uh, inaugural speech which you have given to the uh, young budding social workers, practitioners and the people all over the globe who have been listening to you and, uh, uh, and the thoughts which you have shared is uh, really thought provoking and it will always be a uh, leading path for the people who are working for the social solidarity. So which is a uh, few words, uh, uh, there are some few questions for you in the chat box sir, is it okay with you? We can read the Absolutely, uh, absolutely fine. Just a Please minute. go ahead. Yes, yes just a minute. Can read out the question. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, you mentioned in your speech that every one of us in this world are equal and have equal rights, uh, despite despite of caste. Race, religion, etc. But if it is so, then why there is reservation on basis of caste, tribe, etc.? Don't you think the term equality is just a mere word mentioned in your chapter and the Indian constitution? Okay, very good question. Good question. I think uh, I, I, I think nobody should be given uh, reservation. Uh, once caste is wiped out, the caste is a reservation, caste system is a reservation policy in itself. It reserves dignity and uh, economic power to some and deprives the rest. So uh, that is why I am saying we have to move away from the traditional system. That is what I am saying, the caste system, which, uh, which is rooted in religion. Unless you eliminate caste, Unless you have a caste, you cannot, you cannot be achieved. Unless, uh, unless you eliminate caste, you cannot achieve equality. And today, as you may be knowing now, every caste, including Brahmins, have got reservation. So now you have two options. You give reservation to everybody on the basis of their percentage of population, or you eliminate caste and you eliminate reservation and let the uh, opportunity be given on the basis of uh, economic criteria, on the basis of the population. That is a better model than keeping caste and giving reservation. End caste, eliminate reservation. Caste-based reservation. Are we prepared to end caste? If we are not ready to uh, end caste, that means we are hypocrites. I think that needs to be questioned. I think I have answered your question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. 
before before uh, we conclude uh, this session uh, i request dr ilango uh, to uh, share few words actually sir was in the hospital till yesterday and he asked me for a minute to talk in this uh, conference uh, dr ilango is my guide and my mentor uh, so uh, and uh, what i am today professionally is because of dr ilango and uh, it is also a coincidence that you both were classmates uh, while you were studying social work so i request dr ilango to share few words uh, before concluding this uh, inaugural session sure 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 my honor uh, to listen to my great friend ilango thank you the first time to our career many many in your state and uh, my dear friend uh, professor ramaya and uh, professor anand sabarthi thank you dear am i audible video yes. audible yes am i audible yes sir you are audible ilango not uh, you are not yeah. seen right okay yeah no i just took the video of ಮನೆ for organizing this wonderful event on uh, the world social work day uh, i think it's a great uh, job and uh, i'm happy to know that the uh, participants are there from several countries now uh, we are going to talk at night about various things and you know, most of the points which we talked about are things which should tell for those local to really upon the over and act upon now the yeah, program has set uh, the importance of universal ideas uh, you know um, and you also spoke about the indian education of social work and the efforts of some section of uh, social presidency to indian education and uh, you know you were also cautioning us about the a uh, danger involved in you know taking a big view and uh, you know uh, doing things in such a way that uh, the one section of the population benefits and the other sections are different so what do we do very few five indigenous indigenous people or the indian people what do we do if there is a uh, hidden agenda of some section of population to suppress the other section then i think it's not an acceptable thing i always keep talking about the global you know uh, professor ami has spoke about universal idea i think it's important for all those workers around the world to realize that we are not primarily citizens of one country alone we are actually a global citizen i think the important of global citizen day is important you all to realize that we are global citizen now if they have a very narrow view that you are a citizen of india you are a person belong to one particular region one particular religion one particular caste then i think that global there we are going to you know, come back they were we are going to know so this is what is happening in the field of social work in the present with promoting what is known as indian social work i don't i don't agree with that they i know my question to my learned colleague who propagated the idea of indian social work like bharatiya kavan is that why don't we talk about indian medicine indian indian uh, you know physiotherapy indian engineering indian technology nobody talks about that 
Why only when you come to third floor, people talk about Indian third floor? The why do people talk about, you know, the, uh, the uh, importance of, you know, uh, our, uh, uh, you know, I'm not undermining the importance of Indian philosophy or, you know, whatever our idea is in there. I think all these things are important. But at the same time, one thing we need to remember that we are all global citizens. As third you of us, we have to be truly a professional. He has to be a global citizen with a multicultural perspective, with a capacity to uh, work with all kinds of people, you know, with a cultural sensitivity. Ultimately, it all boils down to cultural sensitivity. If I realize my if I have cultural sensitivity, then I will be mindful of my fellow human beings. Right, and then I will not do anything which will impinge upon their yeah, right and right. So these are the things that I just want to share. So it's a great pleasure listening to you, Professor Ramya. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ramya, for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Ilango. It's always a pleasure. Ilango was a guide not only to Dr. Gerard; he was also like my guide. I learned my English from him. So um, he's a great friend, and I'm so glad that uh, Dr. Gerald could get Ilongo here and to say a few words uh, about this, uh, his views on this particular thing. Just, uh, just I'll take one more minute, just adding to what uh, Prof. Ilongo said. You know the, you know the global citizenship and a concept equivalent to. Uh, this uh, is our Vasudev Kutumbaka. There is a concept called Vasudev Kutumbaka, which means the whole world is one family. We are all children in that family. We, for a long time, even today, we talk about it in an, any international platform. Yet, although we say that we are a global family and uh, everybody is a children within the family, yet we found the need of sending the British out of India. If we really truly believe in that, we should have kept the British with us after they are part of the family, they are also children. Still we chose to throw them out. Why? Because we found that we are facing subjugation under their dominance. So in a way, we ourselves have shown a, a path, what you can accept, what you cannot accept. You, If you say that you are a family member, though you are an outsider, we still are ready to treat you as family members, provided you don't dominate, you don't subjugate us. The logic applies the same With, within India. We are all Indians, no doubt about it. But no Indian has a right to dominate, discriminate, exploit another Indians. If they do, morally, Morally, one gets the courage to counter them, encounter, to uh, deal with such kind of subjugation. If one gets a moral courage. You know, Dr. Ambedkar also talks about something called moral equality. We are not talking about an absolute equality, which is not possible. He talks about something called moral equality, which means the fact that a particular uh, human being is there, he certainly needs some of these basic things in place. He needs equality, he needs liberty, he needs food, he needs shelter. This he calls as a moral equality. So every human being is equal on this line. And so every individual deserves those basic needs met. You are whether you are a part of the family or not, depends upon how one behaves. This kind of a discourse, I feel, must constitute a part of social work discussion. Social work curriculum must have a strong theoretical input where the students should be made to understand those theories and the contesting position of different perspectives and how they are connected, interconnected and so on. It is only in that light students will be able to understand why it is happening, what is happening. That in my opinion seems missing. Otherwise, the solidarity that we are talking about can be only remain a notional. It can never become a substantial uh, solidarity. 
So we need to move from notional solidarity to substantial solidarity, which cannot be realized unless we deal with the issue of prejudice of various kinds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a few words from my, our Pro Vice Chancellor, too. Thank you, Professor uh, Ramiya. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you. Since uh, more than a year or so, we spoke to each other, and I think uh, you should visit. We should meet physically also. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Our first, uh, our first meeting was a very interesting meeting. Very interesting meeting. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm glad that I could get an opportunity to discuss with you once again. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, question, Dr. Jarrett. The question which we are not able to uh, post and uh, get the clarification, we will be sending to the professor and we will uh, get the answers and we will send to the sure, sure. respondents. And thank you so much. Because thank of time you, constraints, we are jumping to the sure, sure. Uh, banner. Sorry. Um, Thank you. The word of thanks which will be given by uh, Mr. Parmeshwaran, uh, Assistant Professor uh, in our department. Over to Parmeshwaran. Yes. Uh, good morning, Commander. Honorable Pro Vice Chancellor, President Deans, our most distinguished invited guest, ladies and gentlemen. I am very humbled and honored to be the one making the closing remarks. And a word of thanks to such a distinguished and intellectual community gatherings. I, on behalf of an organizing committee and the entire fraternity and together, and on my own behalf, extend my very humble congratulations to all speakers who will raise this grand symposium on strengthening social solidarity and social work intervention by sharing their open access insights and opinions. At first, I must mention our deep sense of organization to Honorable Vice Chancellor of Korea Manima Institute of Science and Technology, Ganjavu, Dr. Uh, Professor Dr. S. Devadasa, who presided over the webinar to try and also deliver the inaugural address in setting up the tempo for the day. Indeed, a special gratitude must go to Dr. Dean Vijay Lakshmima, Dean Faculty of Humanities, Science and Management of Korea, and the Institute of Science and Technology, Dr. for her facilitation and for this her valuable moral support. A big thank you to PSWA, of the IFS through INPSWA, Jobs for Development Norway, Anagram Charitable Trust India for the joint venture and valuable contribution towards this international symposium. Further, we are grateful to Professor Dr. Abhati Ramaya, sir, and uh, Professor and Chairperson Center for Study of Social Inclusion and Inclusive Policy, Data Group of Social Sciences, for giving an excellent coverage and highlight. The special address of this international symposium, demonstrating its excellence on the moral basis of seeking and strengthening social intervention for social solidarity. I also wish to express my sincere gratitude to Professor M. Andrew Sitzraj, Secretary of Professional Social Worker Associations, updated to IFSW through IFCSW. And we also would like to acknowledge our gratitude to all the speakers from uh, seven different countries to this international symposium. And I propose my heartfelt thanks to all participants for having taken your valuable time to join our and grace the occasion in a successful manner. And finally, I thank all the delegates of this program for showing this uh, interest in participating in this symposium. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you very much. So, uh, we are uh, concluding the inaugural session formally now. And once again, we thank the Pro Vice Chancellor and the special speaker, and uh, Dr. Ilongo sir, and all the people who have uh, been here for this inaugural session. The people before me, Dr. Janaki, uh, Director, Center for uh, Rural Development, uh, Professor uh, Selva Kumar, uh, Head of the Department of Political Science, and all my uh, students from various departments. Thank you very much. So, immediately we are going to start the next session in a minute's time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. First session, Allah Kuch. So, uh,
so thank you very much so we are now going to have the next uh, session i am very happy to introduce dr abraham matthew uh, probably in the video which you are seeing it's almost like a day time but the time now there is around 150 midnight so it's this was the commitment of the resource person uh, to give a talk and give the wishes from united states of america on the day of world social work day so it is a great proud for me to introduce my classmate and friend uh, abraham matthew who has just become dr abraham matthew got awarded phd few hours back so first of all department of social work periyar maniyamme institute of science and technology wishes you for the doctoral degree which you have uh, uh, got awarded in the business administration in health care management and leadership uh, first of all congratulations abraham matthew and uh, to make it precise about this big bio data he studied masters of social work under graduation from bishop ibber college uh, trichy tamil nadu india and after that he was a uh, little time teaching uh, social work here in india and after that went to uh, chicago and he served in various uh, capacities particularly he was a health sector social worker that and also an administrator assistant administrator director of social services at lake shore nursing and rehabilitation center chicago and after that administrator resurrection health care villa north lake from 2005 to 2010 and he was a, an administrator at elm brook health care nursing and rehabilitation center elm first and he is an administrator post acute rehab skilled nursing long term assisting living mon monor care health care services will brook hostel and uh, he he also has served precipitator as an administrator at the hostel and uh, now he is holding the responsibility as the executive director for but the rehabilitation services which is an exclusive services for the seniors of usa and this is a great proud for me to introduce my friend and also to share uh, some of his uh, practical experiences with the seniors at the beckner uh, to all the uh, participants so over to you dr abraham matthew thank you Uh, thank you anand jarad dr anand jarad um, i never call my friend uh, dr anand jarad i always call him jerry um, when we used to study masters in social work we all thought that we're going to start an ngo um, two of us and i'm sorry the voice is not clear can you hear me now it's it's very clear okay thank you um first of all yes just like anand jarad said it is a beach that i am sitting Uh, and a coconut tree right behind me besides me or a palm tree but it's actually 1:15 a.m. in united states i'm in the central standard time on the southern part of united states um it's the state of texas the city is houston if you heard about nasa where the rockets go up uh, the space center it's actually 15 minutes from my home so i live very close to that and uh, i came here 2002 i really miss uh being in india as a professional social worker i also want to thank uh, uh dr elko sir he was my professor and it was very nice i was sentimentally touched by 
his presence and the few words that he shared. I would like to thank uh, Professor Dr. S. Devadas, uh, who is the Pro Vice Chancellor of the University, and also Dr. P. Vijay Lakshmi. She's the Dean Faculty of Humanities, Science and Management. And of course, also Dr. Ramaya, it was a great presentation and I was enjoying every part of how he was discussing solidarity among social workers, how he was talking about different things and how he was talking about the cohesiveness and uh, the unity that we should have as professional social worker. Now, my roots go back to India. Yes, just like Anand Jerry said, I studied my bachelor's and master's in the best uh, uh, school of social work called Bishop Heber College. And also right after that, I was the first professor at Arikla Mada College as the professor there uh, starting MSW program. And after three years in 2002, I came to the United States. Since then I've been here. I started as a social worker, uh, taking care of seniors and senior living industry. And by God's grace, I grew up to where I am today. Uh, I have around 200 employees and I have around 250 seniors and patients that I take care of on a daily basis. And I appreciate Dr. Anand Jarad for giving me this great opportunity to be on a special day. This is a special day for everybody. It's World Social Workers Day, and I want to wish you all a happy Social Workers Day. Um, I would like to discuss the practical experience of what as a social worker that I went through or I, went, I go through especially during this COVID time in the United States. I would like to share a, a slide that you will be able to see and um, hopefully you'll be able to uh, see it properly. I just wanted to ask uh, the presenters, are you able to see my slide? Yes, yes, you go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, so I just wanted to, uh, okay. So I serve uh, Buckner International. It's a Buckner Retirement Services. Buckner is an international ministry that transforms the lives of vulnerable children, enriches the lives of senior adults, and builds strong families through Christ-centered values. Now, Social Workers Month, Happy Social Workers Month. I just thought this is a great funny thing to say. A uh, mother came at me with a gun and said, your money or your life? I told him, I'm sorry, but I'm a social worker, so I have no money and no life. I hope most of you understand what I am saying. The society that's around us do not understand what we do as professional social workers. It is very sad even listening to a great uh, a legend like uh, Dr. Ramaya from Tara University, how he was sharing so many things, um, we could see how frustrating it is to see how um, our society, our, the world around us, you know, they don't see that social workers can change the world. Uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm gonna discuss about how social workers, how social workers helped seniors we call them older adults and also healthcare workers that was taking care of people, taking care of patients. What, what did social workers do? Most of the time people think that social workers are just, just social workers. That word just has to change. They are real professional social workers. People do not understand the value People do not understand the value of Marina's compass that is in a ship. The captain cannot take that ship anywhere without that campus. That campus is the one that shows the direction. Without the campus, nobody can go anywhere. The campus has to be functional. The campus has to be present, but nobody cares about the campus but the captain. The captain needs that towards to his right hand. To, to steer the ship. Just like that, we social workers, I just wanted to encourage you and let you know that there is a lot of things we can do in this world. There are multiple things that you can do to create a change in somebody's life. As, as social workers, we can create change in an individual. I'm going to share the last one year since March 1st, 2020, 
when we went to the United States complete shutdown for COVID-19 pandemic, how it impacted and what did social workers do? I'm only going to share a very, very part, minor part of our role. And if I start sharing everything that a social worker does, I won't have enough time and Anand Gerard will tell me to stop. So I'm going to be sticking to my time and go through certain points. As of February 28, 2021, just last month, there are total nursing home seniors confirmed cases 640,271. I'm sorry, I'm going by the US version. We don't call lakhs and crores. We call it 100,000, 200,000, 640,271 patients. Seniors got COVID in nursing homes or old age homes, you all call it. Um, total residents who passed away up to February 28th is 130,174. Please change it to the units that you all measure in India. I am so sorry, I, I, I'm not good at that right now. Uh, staff, 552,660 confirmed cases. And look at how many staff died, 1,623. This data, uh, the source, you can actually Google the website, data.cms.gov. This is the uh, body, CMS, that um, um, uh, watches over this data. And in the United States, it is mandatory that you have to present every part of the deaths and COVID cases to the government, and the government keeps a complete tab of everything going around. And going on, this is the graph. If you see what happened during COVID here, Back in May last year, the blue line is the number of COVID patients in nursing homes in, among seniors. And the orange line is the number of deaths. And you see now it has, fell, it has fallen down significantly because vaccinations got introduced in December. So that's a good news. And we don't see much cases anymore and it's getting better. Now, I'm getting to where what social workers' roles are. Social worker, you know, sometimes is time, you know, we are not social distancers. We are social workers. We put our life in front of um, others to help others. We took this profession, we came to study MSW or BSW or did a research or commit ourselves doing social work in some part of this world because we have a heart and we want to help people. And that is the most, most important thing about professional social work. It is different from social services. Social services still exist, to, to, but social profession, social work is where we are celebrating today to recognize that professionalism in this particular profession. Social work profession in the United States is a very well respected profession. Their role is imminent to help healthcare workers and seniors. I just want to show you a quick thing. National Association of Social Work, NASW in United States, is the association that oversees all social work ethics and principles and guides everybody's licenses. You have to be a licensed social worker here to practice social work in the United States. Sometimes people feel like it's only the doctors, it's only the nurses, or it's only so-and-so, uh, or the infection control people, or the health department are the essential workers. They forget that social workers are also essential workers, and we play a big role. Social workers are, um, the NASW, the National Association of Social Work, it talks about how social workers help to address anxiety and other concerns that are arising as a result of this public health crisis. Now, what are the problems that seniors encounter during COVID-19? First of all, anxiety. Anxiety is a disease. Anxiety is a symptom. Anxiety is something that makes the seniors, if you look at that small picture that I posted on the screen, you'll see a senior or an older adult inside 
a senior living community or a facility or a nursing home or an old age home, you call whatever you want to call it, and their family member is outside, they can't see each other. That's not good. We are human beings, we need people. We touch, we hug, we kiss, we show our love, we express our feelings. Imagine one year you are in a lockdown, that creates anxiety. And many seniors even died. Death is another issue that the seniors went through. Psychological effects, isolation, loneliness, lifestyle changes. Yes, what happened during COVID-19? How did somebody's lifestyle change? Well, lifestyle changed during COVID-19 because they cannot get out of their house. They cannot drive their car. They cannot go to a restaurant. They cannot go to workout. In the United States, I've seen some seniors, even 70, 80 years old, they are in the gym running, doing exercise. They cannot do it because of COVID. Lifestyle changed. There are seniors that used to drive every Thursday and a Saturday and a Monday to a restaurant to eat dinner or a lunch or a breakfast because they were tired. They couldn't do that during COVID-19. Their lifestyle changed. They have broken relationships. There were literally people who passed away that they couldn't even attend the funerals. Aging. People started, the, you know, the, even the barber shops, we call it salon, were closed here. So how can you cut your hair? How can you look better? People look like they are 10 years older during this COVID pandemic. That's how bad it affected everybody, especially the seniors. The, the, the depression, and also look at the high risk. The CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control in the United States, it clearly says that eight out of 10 deaths have been in older adults, 65 and older. So seniors were the most vulnerable population during this whole COVID-19 across the world. Now, what happens to healthcare workers? I also want you to remember when I say HCW, they are healthcare workers. We as social workers are also healthcare workers. We take care of people's physical health, social health, psychological health, mental health, behavioral health, you name it. All of those, we coordinate, we take care of them. So we are also healthcare workers. So what happened to all the healthcare workers? There was also anxiety, there was also death, there was also psychological issues, isolation, lifestyle changes. Some of them lost their second job or even their primary job because of COVID-19. And financial burden, depression, and of course, higher risk because we as social workers or healthcare workers, we are standing next to somebody that has COVID. We don't work in the IT profession where you can sit behind the desk and a computer and make big money. We really touch people. We touch people's heart, we, their mind, their body. We help them. That's what we are. We are like the frontline military people. When there is a war, here we are trying to help others. We forget ourselves and we put ourselves at the front line. Just want to move on to the next slide. Now, role of social worker and impacts on the life of the seniors. Social workers were able to provide psychosocial help. Yes, there were no nurses or doctors that want to sit down and talk to somebody during COVID pandemic. Social workers spent time to sit down and talk to somebody, especially the seniors. They had somebody to talk to. They used to have family members come and visit them every day. Their grandchildren, their sons, their daughters, their in-laws. Now they cannot. It's the social workers that are sitting there and listening and doing that psychosocial treatment to our seniors. Social workers were able to connect families. They increased um, you know, uh, communication. They help them through social engagement. They did virtual services. So this is very interesting. The first time a social worker is walking around with an iPad to connect a senior or a patient with their family through FaceTime or, or Duo or 
Zoom or whatever that technology is, social workers took technology in their hands and they started doing virtual services to the patients and residents. Discharge plans. Doctors signed the orders after a hospital treatment. In the United States, social workers are there in every hospital. Their main role is to do discharge planning services. They have to make sure the patient, when they're after treatment, they're placed properly. And the other important thing we all know, we do camps, we do group projects, we do different things, right? When we study MSW, I'm flash back, flashing back my own mind. We create awareness and education. We create awareness and education about COVID-19. We help people to know how COVID-19 can come. We could be that people to help with infection control, how you can control that. And we could be that people that um, help to create awareness among this whole world. We could be the one. National Association of Social Work in the United States played a very, very important role. It's a very strong body. The National Association of Social Work has a lobbyist in the Senate, and they have direct connection to speak to the president of this country if they want to. It's a very strong body. And also what social workers did is referral services. And now, how did social workers help other staff? Same thing, psychosocial help. Now here's another interesting thing, arrange food delivery. So for example, I have, I have 200 employees and I have social workers that work there. I have doctors, nurses, nurse practitioners that come, the nurses who stay there. And we also have all other professionals. We have the executive chef uh, to provide food. We have licensed dietitians. We have therapists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists. We have all kinds of staff in the building that I am in. And all these 200 staff, they all are vulnerable. They all go home. And I had a few employees that got COVID and they're at home for 14 days. We as social workers how to arrange food delivery so they don't have to go out and buy food when all of them left them and they are by themselves in their homes. We helped arrange food deliveries. We check on them, call them and say, how are you doing? Social workers did that. Social workers made sure we have enough PPE, which is the personal protective equipment, the N95 mask, the face shield, the gloves, the sanitizers. We coordinated to make sure that everybody can get it or it is accessible. We connect them with resources and we help having them sign up for the governmental programs and financial assistance plans. Now, vaccines are out. We are coordinating to make sure everybody gets vaccination. In the United States, up, this is as of yesterday, 106 million doses are given. Just one day ago. And Texas, the state that I am in, has 8.42 million given. At Butner, where I serve, in the Houston location, 96% of our seniors got vaccinated. This is a big victory. And as well as 65% of our healthcare workers accepted the vaccination. Now, I want you to know that you matter. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matthew, for your precise and uh, a brief presentation about the Vecna. It was thought provoking and the services which you are offering and the various uh, things which you have connected with the professional social work and the commitment of the social worker in serving the seniors is really amazing and impressive. So, uh, uh, I, I would like to uh, give the floor to the participants. If you have any questions, kindly put in the chat box so that we can ask the resource person and uh, we, he will be very happy to uh, answer you.
So since uh, <coughs> there was no chat uh, uh, post till now, I would like to ask you a question. So when it comes to the seniors, uh, is uh, how difficult it is for the staff uh, to take care of them psychologically or physi physiologically and what challenges you are facing? Yes, so mentally nobody is prepared to handle this pandemic. So the role of the social worker is to not only encourage and help the residents, the patients, the seniors, the human beings that's coming for treatment, also the staff members. They are scared because after work, they have to go home. They may have children, other old people in the homes, their husband, their wife, their family, brothers, sisters. So this COVID can be really bad. It was very tough. But as social workers, what did we do? We were able to provide them the best PPE. We covered them, we provided everything they need. We were able to secure all the PPE for them so they can feel comfortable. They are walking into a patient's room or somebody that has COVID. We actually gave everybody, everybody COVID testing. We tested everybody. I have a COVID testing kit in my house because I can test before I go to work. So we provided all the things that we could get for them from governmental resources so we can make them feel comfortable. Okay, I am not going to send a military person to the war without a gun. I need to give them a gun. Likewise, we have to arm our frontline workers with appropriate equipment that can protect them. That's the only way they're going to do the job right. That's what we did. We made sure we tested them. We made sure we gave them uh, everything um, you know that they need to protect themselves, that they would feel comfortable. I see some chat questions. Let me see. Um, study. Okay, there is a private message that came to me from Professor Andrew. It said, "You study social work in India and practicing in U.S. What do you think we need to do to enhance the quality of?" Okay, good question. The social workers in India, what do you have to do? Well, you need a. I mean, in India, social workers first need solidarity. This is a perfect topic. Time is of the essence that we are talking. What we need is a national movement that professional social work is different from what people think what social work is. There should be a body, there should be a board, that should be a nationwide board that regulates social work, that, uh, that gives the, um, um, what to say, the credentials uh, to say, okay, if you studied MSW, then you are going to be given this opportunity. They should recognize our Masters in Social Work program across the country as one of the most important programs. That's what they did in the United States. So MSW is a profession. We don't call it a degree, it's a professional degree. And, and, and that's, that's exactly, um, we, but so we have to fight, we have to work, we have to work together. You know, the, Dr. Ramaya mentioned about cohesiveness. If two doctors meet each other, they won't even say hi. If two lawyers meet each other, they won't even say hi. Look here, 100 social workers. We all feel like we belong to each other. We all study the same principles of social work, right? That unity has to go across. Uh, hopefully I answered that question, Professor Andrew. Thank you. So I think uh, the next resource person is Professor Andrew, and he is, to, he is going to deal with that uh, particular uh, uh, thing which you have uh, given us the suggestion. So I think uh, uh, it is a platform for Professor Andrew to present uh, his uh, presentation next. So thank you so much, uh, Abraham Matthew, and there is another one question from the audience. Good afternoon, sir. This is Dr. This is Dr. Nyamaj from the Department of Social Work, working as a child uh, city coordinator. What is the difference you observe serving others in India and the US? Big difference. Um, 
in India, uh, there, are, there are a lot of difference between how things are done in India and United States. In India, if you work in the bank, people think, oh, that's a big salary. In United States, if you work in the bank, no salary. If you live in India, you know, there's a lot of differences between how we do things there. In India, the government do not recognize seniors with benefits other than the retirement pension. They don't have specific programs. They don't force the local, state, municipal, and the governments, district governments, to have special programs for seniors. So if you don't even recognize the seniors that they are so important, you can't create any programs for them. Now, if you look at what the culture is, eastern part of the world wants to become the western part of the world which is everybody works. The type of family structure, all that is changing. Everybody works. So if you look at that situation, where are the seniors going to go? They need a quality life. They need a better life. So in the United States, the government has given a lot of importance. There are rules and regulations that you can study, which is hundreds of pages how to take care of a senior. And if we violate and we do something wrong, people can go to jail in the United States. So the importance given to seniors in the United States makes the biggest difference when I can say what the difference between India and here. So we as social workers have to be that frontline person speaking about all these problems. We should go present all these things in the Lok Sabha or somewhere higher up there. We should go and talk to them and say, hey, do you know this problem happens? We need to, uh, you know, we talked about the caste system, the class system. You know what? The political system needs to change. They need to think about the people, not the government. They have to think about the people. I'm sorry, I don't want to take much time of uh, Professor Andrew after me. Any other questions? Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Hey, Matthew, this is uh, Moses here. Nice to hear you, buddy, after a long time. It's wonderful, and it's a great explanation. Proud of you, man. Uh, first thing, you know, I just wanted to ask you this question. You know, I know seniors have been given in, uh, such a good importance in the United States. Yes, the rules, regulations, laws play a major role, you know. Uh, that in India, we need to do. I know, I think, social worker, as such, we have to do. Though we are placed in different, uh, you know, uh, professional area, you know. That's a good topic uh, to discuss about. But I just want to ask you this question. You, know, you were talking about the safety protections that you know you were giving for senior citizens. You know, we knew that in uh, you know US at one point of a time the mask was also a challenge. You know, there were a lot of challenges on treatment part of it. How do you guys manage at that point of a time? You know, as a social worker and talk, taking care of senior citizens, it would have been tough, right? Maybe you could share some few thoughts. Are you talking about the mask availability? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. First of all, Arun Moses, Anand Gerard, myself, and I think Steve is on this call to some of our classmates. We all studied together. And Arun Moses was in the United States, in New York, uh, for a project a while ago. Uh, anyway, thank you, Arun, for asking me that question. Uh, mask availability was a big problem. That is correct. So what we did is we made cloth masks. We ask the people to wash their mask and wear it every day the same mask. So we didn't give them every day different masks. So we figured everything that we could do. The United States government put the military to work. Every military person was in the manufacturing place making masks. People in their homes were making masks. My sister-in-law made 30 masks my brother's wife, and she sent it to a hospital in New York when New York had the first problem back in February, March last year. The whole community came together to help each other. We actually try to um, make use of the mask as much as, you, much as we can. We were able to reuse them. We found different ways to do it, and we shared our resources. And, and that's how we managed. Um, 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 I, I hope I answered the question. This is not something nobody was prepared. This is, uh, this is just like 
throwing somebody in the water who does not know how to swim. Okay, thanks. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to also add, um, I, um, by, by the grace of God, you know, I studied social work in India and I still carry the principles of social work that I studied in India. Currently, the governor of the state of Texas has appointed me as the chairman to all the nursing homes in the state of Texas. So I serve at the board, which has 1,212 nursing homes in the state. And this is what I do. I, I take care of seniors. I want to make sure they're in a good shape. Um, any other questions? Uh, what is the roles of social worker and political authority in U.S. towards discrimination of COVID-affected people? Um, well, we did not discriminate COVID-affected people in, 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 in the United States. We gave them the utmost of, um, respect and we, we, we did not disrespect them in any way. In the in Uni United States, it's, it's very, very, it, it, you treat everybody with respect, um, especially in the medical field, in the healthcare field. We as social workers, uh, we are the advocates. That's the best word I can use. We are the advocate for anybody that we work with. It, we could work in the prison, we could work in uh, de-addiction centers, we can work in hospitals, we can work in senior living um, uh, buildings, anywhere we are their advocates. If something happens to them, we call the police and that's how we take care of them. I just want to thank uh, Steve, also my friend, also joining, and um, also some of my seniors are also on this call. Anand Jarad, you put so much effort to do this, and I really appreciate it. Uh, do you all have any other questions? Because I do not want to take Professor Andrew's time. Oh, thank you so much, uh, uh, my friend Matthew, for this uh, uh, wonderful presentation, and uh, you have given a very good insight about the uh, work which you are doing professionally for the seniors and it is highly impressive and uh, we also uh, congratulate for the new assignment given to you by the governor of Texas and uh, we wish that uh, you succeed in that and you create more opportunity for the social workers and bring laurels to the field of uh, professional so social worker. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, even though that it's midnight, you you are so enthusiastic and you are so bright uh, in presenting when it comes to the point of uh, uh, the professional uh, carrying out the activities. So this is really uh, inspiring and uh, we love to connect with you in future programs also. Uh, thank you very much for the time once again and thanks. Uh, from our Department of Social Work, Korea Manipur Institute of Science and Technology, uh, IFS, uh, uh, IFSW, uh, PSWA, and INPSWA. And uh, we have another two important uh, uh, organizations who really supported us. One is Job for Development from Norway and Adaglam Charitable Trust, Kudukone. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wish you all best of luck. So, um, dear audience, uh, uh, this will be the uh, last session in the morning uh, time uh, before lunch. Uh, so, this is going to be a very, very important and a very crucial topic which we are going to have as a presentation by our uh, Professor Andrew Jais Raj, uh, who is uh, Secretary for Professional Social Worker Association, which is the uh, affiliated to IFSW through INPSWA to make it uh, brief to introduce about uh, Professor Andrew Sesuraj. Uh, he has completed his Master of Social Work from Loyola College um, and he has uh, been a person who has held a lot of uh, honorary position with UNICEF uh, he is the honorary coordinator for child friendly police initiatives. He is a honorary director 
for Laila Knowledge Hub for Excellence in Child Protection. He is a state convener for Tamil Nadu Child Rights Watch. Um, and he is also a, a task force on advisory convener for forum for promotion of child participation and he is a life member of professional social work association and he is also a secretary a dynamic person and he is also a trustee and honorary director for jiva jyoti action for children and disabled and he is also a convener capacity building for national forum for tobacco elimination uh, so for his credential he has been a, a resource person for training more than thousand police sub inspectors across tamil nadu on the child welfare police officers as uh, as per jj act and uh, poxco protection of children against sexual offences acts uh, covering more than 90% of the police stations across tamil nadu with the support of unicef he is also a, he has also trained 949 police sub inspectors and women police officer across kerala which is nearby state to tamil nadu design designated as child welfare police officer as per jj act and poxco act uh, he has represented un team as child protection consultant in the preparation of post disaster needs assessment report uh, uh, thank you for the introduction i think that should be enough for me because it's yeah. too long <laughs> one one more thing one more thing i want to add uh, he is behind this program he is the person who has given us the uh, permission and the recognition uh, to get uh, the co-branding status of IFSW uh, and because of that this program has gained lot of momentum thank you so much personally to professor andrew sir for this opportunity which you have given to the department of social work uh, to uh, make this program a grand success thank you so much over to you sir thank you thank you jarab sir for those uh, long words of introduction and also the opportunity because uh, uh, because of this covid the world social work day has become a low key affair but unfortunately you were able to make it much much grander than what is expected because every year uh, the professional social workers association for the last um, half a decade we've been conducting social work day run okay where more than 500 uh, social workers and students used to congregate together to uh, organize uh, events but because of this covid pandemic and uh, uh, related uh, uh, lockdown and uh, conditions we were not able to organize such programs now you made it a point that it, it is organized yes thank you and also giving a platform for speak about the national count for social work education bill that is being a hot discussion right now so thank you sir for uh, this opportunity yes my friends today i am going to discuss with you about the national council for social work and how we are expected to build a solidarity so that it becomes a reality uh, before proceeding uh, i think i'm audible am i right yes sir perfect Yes sir, yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes sir perfect yes sir perfect yes sir perfect thank you thank you okay okay social work been in the country for over over 100 years okay social work education and practice has been in this country for over 100 years but unfortunately we are yet to be recognized as a profession yes the uh, the ugc the university grants commission a few year in 2019 to a letter by one of the students asking for post metric scholarship has maintained that social work education is not a professional course is this exactly what was said by the uh, ugc the reason which was given to this decision was that 
the social work profession or social work education does not have a council a council or a regulatory body to regulate the social work education so it has become a point that we should have a social work council so from then the in, we have intensified the discussion on need for a council but it was not due we have been discussing about, about social work council rights since 1985 with the niti ayog at that time it was the planning commission so uh, my my ppt is not moving white why Okay, now I, I uh, is my PPT is visible? The history of social work education and practice in India? No, sir. No. Yes or no? No, sir. Okay. It says it is paused. Okay, anyway, I let me not uh, uh, concentrate on the PPT, otherwise I will miss my time. Okay, so the the social work was something uh, as I was telling you was here in this country for over hundred years. The first shortened course in social work was started in collaboration with Social Service League. That was an organization at that time in Bombay in 1920. At that time, there is no UGC. It is called the Inter University Board. Which was later called as Association of Indian Universities. One day, nineteen later, that the UGC came into existence. This was in 1920. That was only a small uh, diploma course. But in uh, 1936, the Tata Institute, the Ravi Tata Graduate School of Social Work. In 1936, the social work training came into existence. In 1952, the Madras School of Social Work was est established. The social workers have created a tremendous impact on the social scenario in the country over the century. A lot of changes have been impacted. We have created hundreds of models on social work education. To give a simple example, the Childline 1098. The Childline 1098 is one model of social work intervention. The right to uh, the, uh, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. The, the background was from an NGO model, a model of social workers. There are lots of models, child elimination. We have lots of models we have created in changing the social scenario. The Professor Ramya was speaking about discrimination. We were able to set models. We were able to create models to, 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 uh, to bring an answer to this discriminatory society, to bring social equity in the society with all these changes that we have created in the society we are still unrecognized our profession is still unrecognized as i remember when i was a student okay, of social work when i said my father that i want to study social work my father asked me oh good that's it's good because uh, Doing social work is always good, but what will you do for your uh, uh, livelihood? Social service is not going to get you any any livelihood because social work as a profession was not visible. It was not 20 years back. Even today, when I say, when I go to different government offices, because as part of my advocacy for child rights, I meet different offices. When I say that I'm a professionally qualified social worker, they'll ask me, 
oh that was really great sir that you are doing a marvelous work but what will you do for your livelihood people don't even know that this is a profession that can give us livelihood it was not recognized so at this point of time we have been discussing okay a lot of government departments right since uh, 1950s we have government standing orders where it says certain positions are reserved for social workers professionally trained social workers for example in imh institute of mental health in chennai for to be termed as a, a social worker in the organization you have to complete msw with mnp medical and psychiatric social work otherwise you cannot be employed there so we had legislations we had rules standing orders but in the days proceeded we lost our glory some of the social work positions for example in tamil nadu slum clearance board we had more than 10 positions on social for social workers now it has become thin with all the retirements no one was replaced in cmda chennai metropolitan development authority there was a social development community development wing the community development wing does not have any social the last social worker retired 2 years back after that no one was appointed and many of our social work students who have completed in the recent years were not able to secure a government a seat in the government job it's not only about securing a position in the government it's also about the quality of service if a quality if you and i a trained social worker is positioned is placed in those positions i'm sure that we would have created a difference we would have made a difference a professionally qualified social worker can bring in difference but unfortunately those places are filled by non professionals a two years back we we filed an rti with the the department of health asking how many social workers are appointed in the district headquarters hospitals and we got uh, the information from different headquarters hospitals and we also received the calls because the letter had had our phone numbers also so people started calling us sir it was happy that there is a social work association i also want to be part of the association after 15 minutes of chit chat i was asking them oh great which college did you study ah, i studied in uh, this university sir in open university sir i did sociology sir oh my god a person who had studied sociology in a open university has been sitting in the hospital has trained a social worker where you and your friends trained social workers should be sitting that is the pathetic situation and how are we going to address this and the address is the answer is a national council for social work unless we have a national council for social work a regulatory body that regulates the social work education and social work placement and practice we are going to be in in a, in a, in, a, in a trouble you heard about bar, bar council of india okay the bar council of india is the organization that regulates and represents the indian bar the advocates so it prescribes standards and professional conduct and etiquette for the lawyers the advocates it also represents as protecting the rights of the members of the bar privileges of the members of the bar and interests of the advocates and we also heard about we know about the medical council of india of course now it is renamed as renamed as medical commission national medical commission so it's a statutory body okay and it was brought so that there is a standard in medical education 
so the it, it, it gives grants it grants recognition for medical qualifications it gives accreditation to medical schools it grants registrations to medical practitioners and monitors the medical practice in india so any professional body should have a regulatory body unfortunately they have become invisible to our policy makers our policy makers do not know that there is a profession called social work after long discussions using the pandemic break we were able to come out with a national council for social work education 2021 it's a long dream after over a centenary over 100 years of social work practice in india one in 2021 we were able to come out with a draft bill and we had a wide discussion 15 social work associations across the country 15 social work institutions like uh, the perier manema institution and one non government or some student groups also organized consultation on this bill they have provided suggestions comments and this was conducted for social work educators so practitioners at different levels at the institutional level at the state level at the regional level covering large parts of the country so that every one's concern are taken into consideration in preparing this national council for social work education bill 2021 and now we are in a very crucial stage the national council for social work education bill has reached the prime minister's office now it is there in the prime minister's office we are able to submit it and we are also given this national council for social work education uh, bill draft to the ministry of education and also to niti ayog because one mr dr muniraj he was there as our voice in the niti ayog and we were also able to share the same with other relevant ministries including social justice and many other uh, women and child development many other departments big wherever social work is concerned what next now the bill is in the parliament uh, prime minister's office now the bill is in the ministry of education now the bill has to go to the ministry of law where are we what should we do first is we need to create visibility we were able to create visibility out to the people to the people we are working we were able to give visibility to the voices of the people for whom we are working but now it's time that we need to create visibility for the profession for which we are committed to we have to bring visibility to the changes we have made in the society the kind of changes we have created in the society we have to bring visibility to the impact that we have created and we have the responsibility we have the, uh, the, the duty to speak about this bill the existence of such a bill because this bill has to now go to the law commission for its approval once the law commission approves it has to go to the cabinet cabinet of the union government once it passes through the union cabinet it has to go to the lok sabha and rajya sabha once it goes to the lok sabha and rajya sabha when it is passed it has to go to the president for its for his assent assent but this will not happen this will not happen without you and me we have to start speaking about it we have to create visibility for this national council for social work education bill unless you and i keep discussing about this keep speaking about this with our fellow professionals wherever we are wherever we meet with our co-workers in the organizations in the institutions so that 
the discussion about the national council is alive we need to create the discussion with your students with the faculty members so that it becomes a point of discussion it goes wider you have to start discussing about with the government departments wherever for example the periyar maniyamma is the nodal organization for child and in child life so whenever you meet the government departments you can speak about the national council for social and education bill so there is a visibility created and as students here when you have the students are present here we can create visibility by creating memes on social work education bill posters put this up in your statuses create hashtags create videos yes we need to keep discussing about national council for social work education bill to make sure that it becomes a reality it becomes a reality in our near future and thirdly you become a member of any of the association i don't say that you have to become a member in my association the professional social workers association in india we have more than around 15 uh, professional bodies professional social work associations and out of which around six of we are we are six of us came together to create the india network of professional social work associations and you can be a member being a member is your responsibility i remember whenever i speak to my colleagues my friends my professionally qualified social work friends okay you should become a professional a member in one of the associations and they will ask me what is the benefit i will get if i become a member i'm sorry my friends it's not for the benefits it's for the dignity don't look for benefits here if we do not dignify our association if we not raise up to stand with the profession the profession will not dignify you so unless you become a, you, you strengthen the profession unless you become a member you cannot strengthen the profession be a member become a member of any of the professional social workers associations today we speak about ubuntu a south african context which speaks about i am because we are when we say i am because we are it's about solidarity we are that's why i exist i exist because we are existing without upholding the dignity of social work social work profession we cannot claim ourselves that we are social workers so in this day of world social work day let us together stand united and strengthen our social solidarity and global connectedness the dignity for social work profession is the dignity for social work professional the more you dignify the profession the more you will get dignified as a professional and this will reflect in the society when the profession is respected the profession is dignified we together can create a dignified society a society without any discrimination thank you and over to you for questions now the floor is open for questions if there is anything you want to ask kindly put in the chat box there are people who are saying i support you thank you thank you thank you so much okay mr ms esther was asking me uh, sir could you please brief about the membership procedures in your association yes um, uh, i have uh, in the screen you can see a link uh, in that link the resources tab you can find the membership form you can download it 
and you can fill it and attach the uh, re required enclosures and you can send it to the address given. We take only students who have completed social work from a regular university or regular college. We do not give membership for those who are completing social work from correspondence or open universities. The reason is a profession should, have, should, be, should be learned only in a regular university. We need intensive training to become a qualified social worker. So that's why this professional social work association only takes the uh, students who have completed social work from regular course. Have I answered your question, Madam Esther? Uh, we have two. Yes, sir. Thank you. Questions. Thank you so much. So thank, thank you so much. We have three kinds of we have three kinds of memberships. One is uh, life membership. Life membership is. Uh, 1025 rupees as uh, the life membership fee and then we have an annual membership that's only 100 and, uh, two, uh, 225 uh, is the annual membership and then we have student membership any student who are studying MA social work can become a member uh, as a student member it's 100, 100 rupees per uh, across until you complete your masters in social work that's one time membership for the students so these are three different types of types of membership we have. Thank you. But what is very important, please, please, please speak about this uh, uh, bill with your friends, with all the government officials whom you meet. I will take the email IDs from of all the registered participants here, and I will send a copy of the National Council for Social Work Education Bill to all of you so that you can speak about this with your fellow professionals and also to anyone you, you meet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for the wonderful presentation on building solidarity for National Council for Social Work Bill in India. And uh, we really appreciate your efforts and the perseverance in uh, making up this draft and uh, working in various forums and uh, even uh, designating the information to various categories of social workers, practitioners, academicians, budding social workers and all these people and which has really come up to this level of draft and we hope that Surely there will be a recognition for us getting a National Council for Social Work and bringing a quality education in social work and also licensing, even accreditation, all these things which are all very, very important for a social work profession because this has to go a long way in building up the human uh, values, human ethics and also the well-being of the downtrodden and poor uh, people. So uh, your presentation has really given an uh, inspiration and uh, this forum also congratulate you and thank you personally for giving us an opportunity uh, to associate with you and uh, give the information about PSWA and National Council. Thank you very much sir. Uh, and I think there is one more Okay. Okay, it's only an appreciation, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So, so now um, we are going to have a lunch break, uh, and we will be coming back by 1:50 exactly. And I really appreciate all the participants who are seriously attending this program and encouraging us, <coughs> sending us private messages. Um, and you are very, very serious about this program. So I really appreciate you. And the afternoon sessions are going to be given by a very renowned professor from uh, uh, James Cook University. Mr. Noni Harrison is going to handle the session uh, by exactly by 1.55. And uh, uh, we will be having two resource persons, uh, from one from Mali and another one from 
uh, Malawi, who is going to give the information uh, on uh, uh, strengthening social solidarity among uh, children and youth and strengthening social solidarity among agri brothers. Uh, and finally, in the valedictory section, we will be uh, having the most renowned learned professor, uh, Dr. Steve Hothersal from Edgekill <coughs> University. And, uh, and uh, uh, many people are asking us about the feedback form. We are having a uh, uh, comments feedback form and that will be given during the uh, valedictory session. So once again, thank you very much for attending the morning session and uh, we are concluding now and uh, in another one hour, exactly by 1.50, we will be uh, starting our next session. Thank you very much. <coughs>
Okay, thank you. I'll be ready when you're ready. Yes, it is. Can you hear me clearly? Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Um, yeah, I I have my um, I am unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. No problem at all, my privilege. Yes. Okay. Thank you, no problem. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much. It is indeed my honour to be here today and I hope that you can see me and hear me and I'll share my um, a PowerPoint screen with you as well, if I can do that. I'm not sure if you can see my PowerPoint. Mm. This is um, not going to let me share my PowerPoint. I apologise for this. Technology doesn't always work as smoothly as we would hope. Mm, slides haven't been shared. I apologise for that. Um, 
It doesn't look like it's going to let me share them either, does it? I apologise. Can you still see me? Can you see and hear me? No, but can you see and hear me? I'm sorry, I can't seem to, it doesn't seem to allow me to share. I apologise, it is not letting me share my screen. Okay. I apologise for that. I'm not... I've... <clears throat> I'm not really understanding why it's not allowing me to do that. Anyway, what I might do though is give you my, is continue on with my presentation and I can, um, because I realise time is very valuable to you and um, I can maybe forward my presentation by email to you and you can share it if you like with um, the participants at a later date. Would that be acceptable to you? Okay. Um, and um, yes, I think that's many challenges um, from trying to do technology from far away. And, and I guess we're just experiencing one of those right now. But let me um, begin, and I'd just like to begin by acknowledging um, Dr. Sebastian, please thank you so much for um, inviting me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about women's solidarity, inspiring innovative social work practice. And I want to acknowledge also, as you did, um, Professor Alango Ponaswamy, and his colleagues at Bathara Dasan University. Um, it's lovely to see some of you here today and to, um, and I just appreciate his um, continued engagement. We've been working together now for close to a decade. So it is really um, a lovely an opportunity to continue this collaboration in this way. I also want to acknowledge the distinguished guests that are here today, the other eminent presenters, and also the symposium attendees, both students, academics, and of course, practitioners. And I just also would like to um, acknowledge and, and give you best wishes for World Social Work Day. Here in Australia, we're at the end of our day, and um, I have had the fortunate opportunity to attend World Social Work Day events today. And so it's good to know that that solidarity of social workers on a day like this is um, evidenced in, um, in what we're doing across the globe at the moment. So let me begin by telling you what my presentation aims are today. And really wanted to talk about drawing connections between women's activism, 
their solidarity, their commitment to social change through activism and innovative, socially just social work practice. And ask ourselves, I guess, what lessons can we learn from social movements like the women's movement that can help inform us our, our social work practice? But also, and I, and I imagine that you are, have a lot of expertise in this area yourself, and so maybe it is about reminding us. I know when I was at a presentation earlier today, it was a great opportunity to just be reminded about what the core of social work is about and to be reconnected with other social workers. I think that's what the World Social Work Day theme is about. It is about solidarity. So this is also going to be an opportunity for us to explore examples of women's activism and solidarity and innovative social work practice. So what are these connections? How do, what do they look like in practice situations? I also wanted to, to develop an understanding of social movements such as the women's liberation movement and identify activist strategies that cross the boundaries between the movement and social work practice. One of the things that I noticed in a presentation I attended today is that the social worker and emeritus professor and a very experienced practitioner was talking about the importance of social work still connecting to radical, particularly she was interested in radical social movements and how important that is as part of our reaching out to other members of the community. So I also wanted today to remember to bring a critical lens to the assumptions about the inclusiveness of social movements and the reality of solidarity and boundary crossing. These aren't uncontested assumptions and I think that it is important for us to think about how um, in reality they're a little bit more complicated than saying we all come together in solidarity. I think that when we're thinking about who that might be, we need to be a more critical lens to that. But before I begin my presentation, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself because one of the things we do as social workers, I think, is we reflect on ourselves in practice and the impact of self. And we try to bring a critical lens to yeah. <laughs> So um, I just wanted to say, as you know, that I'm speaking from a place called Townsville in Australia. And Townsville is in the northern part of Australia, right up north in tropical Australia. And it is actually quite a similar place in many ways to Tamil Nadu. So it can be very hot and dry and with a wet season. So when I've had the fortune to travel to India to work with um, colleagues in Tamil Nadu, I have noticed that our, our geography is very similar. So I've always felt at home in that sense. But here in, um, in Queensland, it's the state that I'm in and in Townsville, um, it's important to remember that before Europeans um, colonised Australia, that this land belonged to Indigenous Australians. So that when we are presenting, and here I am presenting from my um, home in Townsville, I'm presenting on um, Aboriginal land. And so we always begin our presentations by recognising that. So I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Bindal and the Walgarukaba people, and their elders, past, present and emerging. And I identify myself as a non-Indigenous academic. And I've been teaching social work here at JCU or James Cook University now for nearly, for over 20 years. And I've also worked in, as a social worker in, um, in the women's sector, particularly. So I have worked in the, women, the local women's shelter 
And as you read out in my introduction, I've also been on the management committees of the Women's Centre and currently I'm on the management committee of the Domestic Violence Resource Service and I've just come from a meeting, a committee meeting from there. So one of the things that I have noticed in my academic work and in my um, work within the community, either as a member of management or as a worker myself, is that the connections between um, feminist ideals and women's movement and social work values often overlap. And so I've had the wonderful opportunity not only to teach social work, but also to be involved in teaching women's studies here at James Cook University. So for over a decade, I taught new students about the position of women and the challenges they face in society. And it was always a wonderful experience to share their transformational journey as they learned more about the history of women and women's activism. I was also the director for Centre for Women's Studies. So in many ways, I've been in a very privileged position to be able to, um, to be able to have one um, part of me as a social worker and one part of me in the women's movement. So it's been lovely to, to reflect on both of those and to reflect upon the way that they cross over together. So this week has particularly been opportune in terms of this presentation. So many of you will probably realise that um, last Monday on March 8th, was International Women's Day. And like International Social Work Day, um, the whole of the world um, celebrates International Women's Day. And this year, the theme was Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World. And um, International Women's Day has a long and rich history, and it came out of the women's union movement. And it was about women, I believe, in originally in New York City, saying that they wanted to have better conditions. They wanted their, to be paid equally. And they were willing to go out and do some social action and go out on the street and demand those equalities with men. So International Women's Day is a day for us to join voices. That's women to join voices with people around the world and shout our message for equal rights loud and clear and say women's rights are human rights. And I think that that's one of those lovely crossover points that I was talking about between social work and, um, and the women's movement because it's the focus on improving human rights that I think is at the centre really of both of, our, of, both of these um, important um, movements. So as you know, today is, and why we're here, today is International Social Work Day, March 16th. And as you know, the um, Ubuntu, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly, is the theme, I am because we are. So strengthening social solidarity and global connectedness. Again, you can see just from the way um, that both of those themes are articulated that there are connections there about the importance of coming together to create a brighter future for the groups that we are um, advocating for. So women's solidarity um, is what I wanted to look at next. And so International Women's Day is an example of women's solidarity. So it's where there's a shared goal of a better world for women. So we all come together with that shared goal. But I wanted to alert you to that it's not so um, it's not so uncomplicated, I guess, that we all assume that we come together um, from common backgrounds. It's a little we need to bring our guess, our critical reflection to that a little bit more. But the challenges for women across the globe 
are hugely diverse. Often when we make, when we talk about women's solidarity, I think we can be in danger of making the mistake of assuming that there is a sameness of that experience and the purpose and of, uh, the shared purpose that does not necessarily exist. So we need to always be alert from a critical perspective and ask ourselves, how do we value and maintain solidarity and respect diversity? So the women's movement encourages us to ask these difficult questions. So in Australia, there are Indigenous or Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander academics that write about challenging white feminism. And they, and I have a quote here on my slide that you can't see, but um, it's from an academic called Aileen Morton Robinson. And she says that, Feminists uh, we need to ask white feminist scholars to seriously theorise about giving up power and then to start doing it, i.e. oppressive power relationships can be replicated within social movements. So often um, there's been the critique of the feminist movement that it only represents a few privileged people and the power relationships that the movement is seeking to dismantle are often manifested within the movement itself. So I think that when we're thinking about solidarity, we have to think about it in terms of what are the power relations that we are assuming no, don't necessarily exist but in fact do exist when we come together as a single group and, and form some sort of solidarity around a social action. So um, recently in Australia, as and we have had an example of women's activism and um, solidarity. And I'm sorry that you can't see my slides because I have some pictures about what's been going on in the last few days in Australia. And this has been really um, a major landmark. And um, two weeks ago, there were a number of women who said that um, sexual violence against women and violence against women in this society had reached epidemic proportions. And there were a number of cases of um, that sort of violence against women within our national parliament. And so women came together and said, this has to stop. So yesterday across Australia, and please go ahead and um, feel that, have a look on, on the web about this. It's called the Women, the March for Justice. And um, women had the idea that they would March for Justice and yesterday thousands of women right across Australia did in fact March for Justice and their voices were heard. So on the 15th of March 2021, women across Australia came together to protest the injustice of sexual assault. They planned to form a circle of women around Parliament House in Canberra. So they made sure that when all the parliamentarians, that's the federal government people, were sitting in the parliament, that they were there and they protested and made their voices heard. The movement came from one woman's outrage at just injustice and quickly, in fact, two weeks is how quickly it happened, outrage at injustice and and um, became a shared protest movement across Australia. So I have a quote here from the March for Justice website. It says, an org it was an organic uprising in the only, is the only way to describe the momentum that has gathered. This is a grassroots collective. Now that's such a familiar concept, isn't it, to just social work practice and it comes from the grassroots. This is a grassroots collective that has spread like wildfire and shows no signs of abating. 
So the March for Justice isn't about a single accused or a single survivor. It's about equity for all women. The march is for every woman, they say, because every single woman in this country has the right to be safe in every single space she inhabits. That right has been denied for too long and it has exacted a contemptible toll. So that was their goals. And yesterday, I'm, I'll forward the um, PowerPoint on, I have lots of photos there that I was hoping to share with you about um, the March for Justice. And so, um, so yesterday, women across Australia marched for justice. This march was about justice. It was about recognising the treatment of women in this country is unacceptable. It is about demanding a future in which women are treated with dignity and respect their humanity deserves. And I think one of the most outstanding aspects of this is that women from diverse groups of women participated in this. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, women from refugee backgrounds, migrant women, women, poor women, rich women, women from every part of society participated in this movement that we saw yesterday. It was a truly inspiring moment. And um, one of the social workers that was involved in the program, I mean, in the march yesterday, um, I'll just read out what she said. She said, in my lifetime, and she's an Indigenous Australian woman, in my lifetime I do not think I have seen women from such diverse backgrounds and experiences come together to voice our anger, our disgust and our hurt, but also our determination. Our, our determination and expectation well, that this will get better because it needs to get better. So there, that's a lovely link, isn't it, to what we aim for in social work practice, that we want to make a better world for the people that we work with. We are overtaking the fall for these men time and time again, and we are here today to say enough is enough. So she, the woman who spoke was an Aboriginal elder. Her name is Deborah Fletcher, and she spent 17 years working in the child protection field. So I just wanted to make a few points about that because women, um, women's solidarity is, seems to me to be about speaking the unspeakable. And I think that that's often what we are doing as social workers in the field and in the academy as well. So feminist activi activists speak through the silencing to persist in speaking out against injustices. And what I've just shared with you about the Women's March for Justice that occurred yesterday is about speaking out um, against violence against women and naming it. Speaking out against injustice regardless of criticism and ridicule. So the implications that I identified for that that I think might be relevant to our conversation today are that we see, it's important that we see injustice, that it doesn't remain invisible, that we name injustice, that we speak it out aloud, we shout it in other words like women did it across Australia yesterday. Importantly, that we believe that change is possible and together, working together in solidarity, that we can plan for that change. And we can act to make it happen. So feminist activism involves many different tasks, not just marching in the street as women did yesterday. It also involves analysing, researching, writing, demonstrating, rallying, lobbying and speaking out. It is all of those activities. So with the global agenda, I think there's some lovely points of connection with what I've just shared with you and the global agenda that um, is talked about by the, um, 
the IASSW. So as you talked about in your um, piece that introduced this whole symposium, um, there's the um, section about building inclusive social transformation, the 2020 to the 2030 global agenda. And through consultation, I think their aim is to co-build transformation, to strengthen solidar social solidarity, to improve global connectedness and inclusive transformation. So the solidarity pillar that they talk about, what does this solidarity mean in terms of social work and their vision for where we're going in global social work, the, a practice um, over the next year. So they talk about the pandemic has really highlighted our interconnectedness, that social solidarity within our communities, countries and regions and across the world has become more real but is also being strongly tested. And we can see the way that um, the, um, the pandemic has impacted different countries in different ways according to their resources. It's really highlighted inequality in so many ways. So global solidarity is in protecting our collective futures. So that importance that we've seen, I think, when I shared with you about the women's movement was that seeing a people coming together, women coming together and, a and with a, a vision for a shared future. And here in our social work vision, we see that again. So our collective futures has become the need of the hour. Solidarity takes many forms. Solidarity within and between communities is essential prerequisite for addressing our shared vulnerabilities. So I, I guess I wanted to focus now on understanding women's solidarity from a feminist perspective, thinking about what we've talked about already and maybe making some points about that. That personal disadvantage, I think these are the, the lessons for us to learn in a way. That personal disadvantage is the result of an unjust social system rather than individual inadequacy, that we see things, that we see personal disadvantage as structural in nature, that there are political solutions to personal troubles and the personal is political. Early feminists identified women's disadvantage, advocated for reform and saw the state as implicated in the oppression of women and also as the vehicle for reform. They also saw women's active engagement with the state and participation in its institutions as fundamental to achieving social justice. And I think we do as social workers as well. To value and share women's knowledge, to explore experiences relevant to women's lives, to have an impact on those who formulate policy. So there are lessons there out there for social work and grassroots social work. We value the life experiences of the people that we work with. We believe change comes from making visible those experiences. Feminism is concerned with the exploration of power and how it is used to maintain and reproduce domination and subordination. So that's really important, I think, to, all, to our thinking as social workers. We have lots of points of connection here. In more recent times, there's been the domination of individualism or neoliberalism. And I think the feminist movement has sought to um, to argue against neoliberalism. And I often think that we do as social workers as well. So neoliberalism gives women the message potentially that they have control over the direction of their lives and also obscures women's ability to articulate their oppression as other than the result of individual choice. Solidarity challenges this because its problems are no longer experienced as individuals. They are seen as shared challenges. They challenges that belong to a group that's subject to structural oppression. I see that my time is nearly up. So I'm going to move 
to the final slides that I have and make my final points. So I think that innovative social work practice um, is really about the success of social movements such as the women's movement remind us that change is possible. Women could be powerful if they spoke up and especially if they joined with others. What a lovely reminder that is for us as social workers. And we've just seen that fabulous example here in um, Australia. That a critical feminist understanding leads us to ask questions about the nature of power within movements within the organisations we work in and our social work practice. But un that we understand that the personal is political. The way that people live their everyday lives tells us very clearly about the nature of structural oppression. We can see oppression played out in the way that people have to live their lives. Grassroots movements are powerful. And if we consult, if we listen, understand, break the silence, challenge ourselves and always connect with each other and the people we serve, change is possible. To conclude, I want to make a number of points about social work um, and solidarity. As mentioned in the concept note for this symposium. As social workers, we strive for social and economic equality. We recognise the dignity and value of all people and we recognise human relationships are at the heart of what we do. Social movements can share many of our social work values and they can inspire us to stay connected beyond our own workplaces and institutions. Social movements can remind us to value a broader critical perspective, to resist assumptions of sameness. We are not all the same. Our experiences are not all the same, but we can come together. Women's solidarity has changed and is changing the world through the power of connection through human relationships, transformation is possible. We recognise the power of solidarity to resist neoliberal individualism. And my final thought for you is embrace the spirit of the movement, but value the richness and diversity of your individual context, which should be acknowledged, drawn on and celebrated. So thank you. You're welcome. Please feel 
free to contact me afterwards. And um, lovely to see um, some friends from Bharathadasan University in the chat box. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I apologise again for um, not being able to access my PowerPoint, um, but I will email it to you. And um, if people are interested, then please go ahead and share it with them that way. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, I would like to thank you, the organizers of this forum, uh, to discuss uh, about uh, solidarity, social development, and I would like also to thank all the participants who have uh, chosen this specific topic, focusing on solidarity among young people and children. I am going to share this screen and discuss the PowerPoint that I have prepared with you so that we can um, look at some aspects of the work, the development work um, that are important from my experience uh, for social development workers. And if you look at social development, solidarity issues, Sometimes um, people do not see it as a holistic approach. Government is doing his work, civil society is doing his work, private sector is doing its work. There is no real connection. Or if there, there are connections, maybe the connections are only theoretical on paper, but, but practically these groups are not stakeholders, are not coming together to join effort to provide services, projects, programs for children, for young people in a sustainable manner. So I would like to, as I said, share this PowerPoint now, and we will discuss some, I do have some, well, I can see the PowerPoint, what is that? Sorry. Sorry, I'm trying to yeah, share the PowerPoint that I can't see yet. Um, yeah, it's here. Thank you. Can you? Oops. No, this is not. Right. Yeah. Can you, can you share the PowerPoint? Please, I, it, it is not working on my side. So I will ask the technical team to share the PowerPoint. Can you share the PowerPoint? Or uh, can you allow me to share it? Maybe that functionality is not operating. Yeah, it's here now. Can you see that? Can you see the PowerPoint now? Okay, so yeah, let's continue then. Um, if you look at the issue of strengthening social solidarity among the youth, I would like to talk first about promoting credibility for social solidarity initiatives among children and youth. Then I will talk about empowering stakeholders for sustainable social solidarity among children and youth. And then I will talk about funding social solidarity initiatives. Where do we get money to fund uh, initiative for children and youth? And finally, we will have a time for questions and answers. If you take a look at social development, I would like us to see it as a tree. If you look at this tree, you have different parts of the tree. And it starts here with... Uh,
there is a problem still. Yeah, the roots here. At the root level, I want to tell you that it is important for social development workers to understand that national level projects should be rooted into international conventions or international agreements. So development workers, whether it is civil society organization or government organizations, should link their intervention to international conventions and agreements. And in this case, that are framing what should be done as a priority for young people and children that is agreed, for instance, at the level of the United Nations or at the level of regional institutions. If it was Africa, I would say African Union, for instance. And it could be sub-regional level, like ECOWAS. But this is key. And then from international conventions or agreements, these needs to be translated into national law and policies. That is happening at the level of the parliament, and there are a lot of politics involved to adopt international convention at the national level so that national actors can translate it into reality in accordance with the law at the national level. And then we come to the branches from law and policies, programs should come. These are branches for me, if we see the tree. So branches, pro development programs for children and young people should be rooted in the law to be in line with national legislation and national legislation should be rooted in international convention. And what you see as leaves are projects for different organizations for different period. It could be three years, two years, six months, five years projects dealing with specific issues for children and young people. But I want to make the point here that projects should not be developed by partners or stakeholders independently from national priorities that are in national programs. And national programs should be rooted in national law and then national law should have its origin from international convention or agreement, in this case, to promote the rights and the services for children and young people. Next, I want to tell about empowering stakeholders for sustainable social solidarity among children and youth. And there are four levels and four key stakeholders if we want to provide sustainable services for young people and children, I'm not dealing with specific kind of project here because if you go online, you can see international organization like World Vision, like Plan International, like Serve the Children. They, you can search on their lines and you will see a lot of examples of typical projects that you could you know, implement for children, for young people, uh, but my focus here is how can we build the power of all the stakeholders involved in providing services projects uh, you know for children and young people so the four levels as i am saying are as here if you look at there are four levels, as I said, and I am taking the first group of stakeholder, which is civil society organizations. The level one here has grassroots organization, like small groups of women, young people, and other kind of groups at the rural level, community level that come together and that want to do something about the problems they are facing. We are talking about children and young people here, street children, young people not having work, uh, job you know, for young people or training for young people, uneducated young people, all sorts of problems at the grassroots level. There are organizations working 
there and they need attention in terms of empowerment, capacity building. The next level is formalized uh, actors like international NGOs or national NGOs, human rights associations, or some religious entities that are focusing on children and young people. This level needs empowerment also. And most of the time, you will see that these organizations are the one that go and give resources to the local grassroots organization at level one so that they can implement initiatives together. And level three here is umbrella organizations at the, uh, the upper level. Uh, this is like organizations that are uh, in, in the health sector that come together and work on strategic issues with governments or with technical and financial partners. And at level four, you have national platforms. These are national civil society organization umbrella, uh, organization that actually discusses with the president or with the prime minister or the speaker of the house of, of the parliament. Uh, these kind of top level organizations also need attention and the work that they do should not be the same. If you go down, you should see practical things, but as you move up, you should be moving to strategic issues like advocacy, policy advocacy at the top level, and you should be discussing priority issues as you go down. But as I said, uh, all these, need, these levels need attention. And normally we should be organizing the work in a smart way that will combine efforts from these different levels for civil society organizations. The next group is the government or state agencies. And at the level one there, down, you see here the municipal or local level governments. These people have programs for three years, for four years, for five years, it depends on the countries, but they need to focus on what they can do at the local level to handle issues with children and young people. And then you go to the regional or district level, depending on the country. Regional level programs are upper level compared to municipal level. They also need to actually consider all the municipalities under their responsibility when they are doing the planning. And you come to the level three for government actors, you have sectorial departments or ministries. These actually decide what should be done in education for young people, what should be done in education for in employment for young people, what should be done for children, etc. And at this level, they need attention if they are not strong enough and empowered enough, they cannot design uh, sustainable policies or programs that will impact the lives of young people and children. And the last level here, level four, for government level are institutions, the president, parliament, Supreme Court, all these levels actually need attention. They need empowerment because most of the time you may even see that there are some officials in these offices that do not understand development issues because they have not been trained, their background, the university background, or even their experiences has nothing to do with development dealing with children with young people so if you want to influence government decision you have to have a strategy to empower the leaders at this level so that they can understand what you are talking about and the priorities the other level that is sometimes ignored in development work is private sector government for instance cannot provide schooling for everyone we need private schools but how do you bring private school people with government stakeholders, with NGOs who are working on education so that they can sit together in a given geographical area to discuss who is strong enough to work where and then create synergy between them. So uh, if you look at that for private sector, it starts with cooperatives or social economic organizations, peasant unions, they are strong enough to do a lot of things to support children and young people if uh, the power that they have is leveraged. Small and medium businesses at level two, 
or this category of groups are also powerful instrument like for um, to provide employment for young people at local levels you know and then the networks of sectorial business companies for instance level three you can use networks of business people who work in the same sector who have the same kind of interest to actually support the work that you are doing for children and young people and lastly what we call in french patrona is the national employers association where you have all the big companies together who are now discussing with government top leaders president ministers to decide policies for employment issues and if you empower these private sector people and you support their initiatives strategically speaking they can create a lot of work jobs for people that the government himself alone cannot do and that is something that is sustainable i want to put a special focus on that because companies if you create them they stay for years or decades like let's take an example if you create a school private school it will stay for hundreds of years but if you work on a development program for two to three years when you finish your program the donor has uh, stopped his support then you cannot do anything again the people will be you know fired and the next children or the young people that are coming up you cannot do something for them but if you invest in private sector it has the potential to keep the work going using local resources and it breaks with dependence with foreign support this is key and the last group here that i want to talk about is um the technical and financial partners if you look at here technical and financial partners are un institutions like unicef for children you can see uh, world trade organization and other world bank many institutions linked to the united nations but you also have bilateral partners like usaid and other yeah you don't see the slide okay um let me stop and share it again can you see it now up oh, no this was not this here uh, sorry um yeah yeah that's where we are uh do you see it okay so yeah i'm making it a uh, full screen now oops it should go up here yeah can you see it great thank you um so what i was saying is technical and financial partners you have bilateral partners like USAID, uh, which is the, the US United States Agency for Development, uh, you know, international development. You have the same in the UK, UK Ed. These are from one government to another, but there are many development institutions that are multilateral cooperation working actors. So you should uh, make sure that at your national level, level one here, these partners should be really supporting municipal efforts. The low level uh, programs that are in your country, it depends on how you call them. Part technical and financial partners should go down there and see what has been planned by local actors, the mayor and his team involving all stakeholders in development at local level and there, people who are working on children and youth programs should make sure that 
the priority of young people and children are in those programs and funding from financial and technical partners are focalized on those priorities. Now you go to the regional level, they also have programs, the sectorial development programs, there, there are programs for health, for uh, education, and other such you know, development initiatives that technical and part uh, financial partners are interested in funding. Civil society organization people must make sure that at all these levels, people are not forgetting children and young people in their different programs. Now, if we continue with our PowerPoint, we see here, um, in terms of funding, how, where do money comes from? I have three main income sources for least developed countries because you know, least developed countries are where you have widespread problems with children and young people, a lot of issues with them. So I'm not talking about uh, high level income countries, but I'm talking about poor countries or least developed countries. First thing is domestic investment. We need to care about government funding. When the parliament and ministries, the ministry of finance or economy are discussing the budget for the fiscal year, civil society organizations need to make sure that their voices are heard to make sure that educational program, health programs, all these social programs are including priority for children and young people in this specific case. And then you also have the second level, official development assistance. This is funding that is provided by rich countries to poor nations. And it is regulated somehow, there is a lot of diplomacy going on to get these fundings. And if your government is very good, it can mobilize you know, funding and provided that the political environment is stable enough and credibility of national institution can actually lead to such funding. But what is important here is for civil society organizations to know that they are mostly, most of the time, official development providers or donors trust civil society organization and channel most of their funding through these organizations. Two main reasons. Sometimes governments are seen as corrupt that's not always the case, but sometimes uh, the most of the time, the problem with government organization is bureaucracy. It's difficult for them to deliver development results for children and young people compared to civil society organization. I'm talking about NGOs, whether it is national or international. So I think international NGOs and national NGOs should really support government priorities and raise as much as they can in terms of funding uh, from official development assistance. Lastly, here is uh, what private sector can do to raise what we call private foreign direct investment. This is not directly social development, but what I'm trying to do here is to break the barrier between what companies can do in the private sector uh, with what NGOs do for development and what government are doing. If you take private foreign direct investment, and I take a case uh, for education, like government does not have resources to build schools, equip clinics, uh, health, health centers in some areas, but you are able to convince private funding donors, investors to come and establish schools or clinics it provides the same services that the government is supposed to serve to, to, to provide. So this is something that we should not uh, forget as we try to promote social solidarity for children and young people. And one more thing here about private foreign di direct investment. If you take the percentage of that investment worldwide, it has been uh, demonstrated by scholars that about 60% is going to Asia 
3% to Africa and on, uh, little than less than 2% for least developed countries. Now you may ask why? Because private people want to send their money where they feel that the funds are secured and they can get return on investment. So they don't want to send their money in countries where there is war, where there is corruption, the institutions are not strong enough. So this is a problem with private uh, investment, but we should actually make efforts so that our countries are strong enough to raise this kind of funding because there is a lot of opportunities there. Now, one last thing. Where does official development assistance come from? If you look at the map of the countries, you, you make a mapping, mapping of the countries who support official development assistance, you see a line here at the international level, it is uh, advised that countries should give uh, gross national income up to 0.7% of their income to support least developed countries, to support development worldwide. Now, if you look at the behaviors of countries, the first graph at my left here, you can see which country is doing the best, its best to support international development. I have Luxembourg here, Norway going up. And at the left here, at the right, uh, sorry, you see which country is giving much money compared to the other. This is different issue. For instance, you can see that the United States here is the one giving much funds, around 30, 35 you know, billion US dollar, 2019. But if you look at the graphic at the left, you see the United States is up here, is not even spending 0.2% uh, of its national uh, GNI, you no know, gross national income in development. So it means that if you are looking for resources to support your children initiative or young people initiative, and you are looking for official development assistance, you need to be careful about which country you are, you know, establishing partnership with, and then it will, you know, maximize. Uh, the success of your fundraising efforts so that your initiative can actually reach as much young people as possible and probably on a sustainable basis. So uh, to make a summary of this intervention, I would like to say that when we do development work, we need to care about what has been set as a priority at international level. And we need to make sure that we are working with government priorities at the national level. Also, we need to make sure that we are empowering all the stakeholders and including all of them in our work. We are not separating private sectors from NGOs, from government, and we should be all working together to plan and compare you know, create synergy instead of uh, seeing people, you know, doing their own thing where they can and struggling still with the issues that do not end. So I will stop here and give time for questions and answers if uh, there are any. Thank you very much.
Iya. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually, uh, the same funding sources that I have mentioned can also be applied to women development. Because, uh, you know, you need to see these things as cross-cutting issues. Uh, entrepreneurship for women, you can actually use private sector, you can use official development assistance, can also work with government funding so that the national budget can provide for it. The key issue is how do you develop skills to get government to fund, you know, the, the, the priorities that will need advocacy skills most of the time. You need to know what, when the, where, uh, at what time of the year the budget is being decided at the parliament. And you need to know the right people to talk to so that the priority are taken into account. This is much more complicated, but for development assistance, you need to be skillful in terms of developing proposals to access them. So it's up to you to, to develop skills to frame your project in a way that will attract funding to women from international donors. And lastly, if it is private initiatives, that also is much more complicated, but is more sustainable. It depends on which level you are. If you are at basic level, this is small project, but as you move up, you can go to, you know, these uh, foreign investment issues uh, that are long term. Okay, for indigenous children and youth, there is a very good uh, point to make. Some donors, you know, work with uh, this mindset, which says that they want inclusion. They don't want somebody to be left, you know, uh, behind in terms of development. So when they provide development assistance, they make sure that people include indigenous people. So if you are working with children and young people, you need to, to make a kind of mapping, donor mapping, to identify which kind of donors are interested in indigenous groups, and especially that are tailoring their funding to the needs of children and young people in indigenous setting. And there are, there are many, uh, and I will let people do some research on that. Thank you. And thank you very much for the opportunity too. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much for welcoming me into this meeting. I'm not sure if you're able to hear me. Let me have confirmations in case somebody, you're able to get me? Oh, great, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for welcoming me uh, into this particular um, discussion. And it's quite a joy for me, especially also to Ivy, who's linked me up to uh, this particular forum. Um, I, I give a great honor to all those that have spoken before me, um, uh, learning from the director of this uh, here, it's morning, uh, it's just morning, it will be noon very soon. So uh, it's been a joy. And um, today, indeed, I come as um, one of the persons who has been involved in agri entrepreneur on the lower level here in Malawi, basically in communities. And my presentation will basically focus from experiential um, narrative of what we've been doing as Invest Inc. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Job for Development. Just to mention uh, that uh, Invest Inc. was founded way back when I was in college. And this came out of the passion to support uh, needy children, especially those that were unable to pay for tuition in their schools. Because my background basically has been, um, I've been experiencing uh, struggles as far as getting to school, where my dad was not able to pay for my school. And um, even went to the college, and just to share that for me to get uh, fees, tuition for college for two years, I really had to work during the night to make sure that uh, that uh, contributes to my tuition. I will share a presentation um, as assigned. Um, let me see if it comes up now. I hope you're able to see. Okay, fine. So <clears throat> I'll share a presentation on strengthening social solidarity among agri entrepreneur. This is a main representation that is focused on experience. And uh, this is being attributed to the efforts of invest locally here in Malawi. And they're coming in for with uh, job development. So I'll call this um, invest job for development a case study. So it's more experiential. Just some basic introduction. Um, I want to see if I can basically see every here. It's like, uh, um, okay, now I can see uh, some information was hiding here. So basic information, introductory information, uh, this presentation is attributed to the efforts that come uh, as a result of the partnership that is there between Invest Inc, which is a local organization. This organization locally, we call it in short, Invest, in Malawi, and of course, uh, Job for Development, JFT, um, in Norway. And um, just to explain a little bit about investing, this is a Mal Malawian non-profit organization that is committed to uh, investing in the lives of uh, the underprivileged, uh, some may call less privileged, by basically supporting them to meet their spiritual uh, in this sense, let me say their inner stand, spiritual stands for their inner gap that need to be filled, uh, an inner need, the physical needs, and physical needs. So you talk about uh, um, the well being of an individual that covers nutrition, health, and all that that makes somebody to live a life 
uh, that is really comfortable as far as their body makeup is concerned and also emotional, um, educational needs, and of course, social needs, uh, which also refer, I think social needs uh, connect very well to the uh, topic of this discussion um, this hour. So invest area of focus includes, but basically not limited to the provision of um, educational support with a primary focus of the orphans and of course the other vulnerable children. We understand that uh, not only orphaned children are vulnerable, but we know that the other children that have got both mom and dad, but maybe their background is not very, very good for them to have those opportunities that are, are meant for everyone, um, like education, uh, opportunity for protection and all those rights. So vulnerable children are included. We know that other children come from really households that um, um, have, are living below the income levels, households that do not have opportunity. Um, and also we look at entrepreneurship for the youth and uh, of course, agriculture projects, especially for the widows. Uh, basically the widows were targeted um, as a result of most orphans we who were living um, uh, under the support of widows, women that were not married, most of them were old, and widows um, came to be uh, our also primary uh, focus uh, because of that. And um, this came as a result of, in one of the committees we used to work um, in the early uh, 2004, we really had realized that most of the orphans that we had targeted for sponsorship were coming from widow-headed families and uh, to other vulnerable women. And then job for development. Yes, yes, dear. Ah. Yeah, I'm in basic introduction, only that maybe I'm slow. I'm not moving as fast as I want everyone to understand. I'll move very shortly. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you for that. And Jobs for Development, a Norwegian non-profit organization uh, which collaborates with and supports local organizations in India, Mali and uh, Malawi that want to give youths and other, others hope and faith in their future. They are supporting projects on agriculture, food production, education, training and entrepreneurship and job creation. That's uh, what uh, Ivan is heading. Now we move to another slide. Social solidarity. I'll be faster because uh, they need for fastness. Social solidarity in this presentation will refer to a sense of interdependency of two or more individuals or entities with a similar goal. The goals are a driving force which cannot be effectively achieved by one part. So each part acknowledges the strength and weaknesses of another and decide to unite uh, to achieve a specific outcome because they may not on their own. Hence, we are because you are the Ubuntu uh, concept. Specific out. Yes, in this particular case study is the well being of the individuals in specific communities. So, solidarity may be across borders striving to share best practices and competencies. In this case, um, our understanding between the job for development and us is what is also fueling uh, social solidarity there and also in the community as we stand to support the initiative. Um, let me move on. As I already promised that we we'll talk about INVEST, job for development partnership in, um, uh, as a case study. INVEST has collaborated with job for development in improving the livelihood of local Malawians, mainly through agriculture initiatives. It is important, however, to understand why greater emphasis has gone to the agriculture sector in this country. Malawi's context is that uh, if we look at the report of World Bank, uh, that is in Malawi in 2020, uh, this reported that the population, this one was an approximated by then, 18.6 million, that was in approximation in 2019, Malawi, uh, as all of us may know that it's a landlocked country, remains one of the poorest country in the world. Malawi is economic heavily dependent on agriculture. Nearly 80% of population is dependent on agriculture. 
And this basically is a driving force to say, why agriculture? Poverty and inequality remains uh, stubbornly high. The latest national poverty rates increased slightly from 50.7% in 2010 and 51.5% in 2016, but extreme national poverty decreased from 24.5% in 2010, 11, and 20, to 20, 20 0.1 in 2016, 2017. Uh, there is uh, basically low productivity in agriculture sector, hence the, the, this particular presentation, limited opportunity in non-farm activities are cited as some of the main contributing factors. This just gives us a little background why uh, uh, coincidentally, a vast job for development has got an emphasis on agriculture entrepreneur. And uh, with this background, we find it fit to discuss a very uh, this very subject uh, in this particular symposium, strengthening social solidarity among entrepreneurs, uh, in this case, uh, agripreneurs. We shall use the Invest and Job for Development uh, partnership as a case study here in Malawi. The two organizations have come together to sponsor students, just to mention in passing, in the various secondary and tertiary schools. Uh, uh, this is a long-term uh, plan to poverty reduction. In an attempt to improve the lives of the young people, invest job for development, also focus on training in entrepreneurship, as already mentioned, creation of job opportunities for uh, the young people. However, on a larger scale, for a short, medium term benefits, agriculture, agripreneurship is the main channel for the two organizations to alleviate poverty in local households. Hence, the main focus of this presentation is basically strengthening the social uh, solidarity among agripreneur um, from which the lessons will be drawn. Uh, before we go to basic um, uh, strengthening uh, the social solidarity amongst agripreneur, it is very important to understand that before this is the solidarity is being established, there is need for preparation uh, work. Hence, we're going to look at preparation work. And basically in two stages, number one, Awareness raising is very important. And number two, strengthening social solidarity among, among the raised uh, uh, agripreneurs using community mobilization process. This is a model that I want to bring in this particular presentation, uh, main focus, uh, which we all may learn from. I know other countries may have used the same, they might have called different name. Now, awareness raising involves awareness to local structures. In our case, uh, you cannot start or implement a project unless the traditional leaders. In this case, uh, we understand that uh, we've got national level, uh, regional, and also district councils. But this, since this focus is on community level, it is important to mention that before you penetrate into a community, it is important to have a connection with the traditional leaders who are very key uh, as far as um, acceptance of a program is concerned. And then awareness with community members. Uh, this community members, we, we're saying that uh, what there's a saying that says one, what one does not know does not exist. Uh, there must be an awareness to change the mindset. Uh, the mindset change uh, that's changing the I am poor mentality. Uh, this, uh, I think, could be common among um, African nations or African countries that everyone, uh, they, they feel they cannot because they think they cannot poor. They are poor. So I am poor mentality has to be dealt with first. One must see the light, the hope of their future. I call that internal asset. Internal asset is that which is within uh, a person, the hope to see the future, that even though I'm in this situation, I can move on and I can see, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I think I can move on and begin to do something to get to the end. And uh, this also involves, includes bringing in models, people from the community that have made um, 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 have made a success from um, a dark situation to a point where everyone is able to point to them to say these are the people uh, that were in this way but then they have achieved what did they do to reach that point so it also involves bringing in models to inspire the new people that are beginning that have been inspired that, that are being involved in the uh, program now the actual community mobilization process CMP, which is a model, um, involves, this is a method used to raise awareness, beginning the process of mobilizing communities to begin 
the actual process of promoting social solidarity among agripreneurs. This refers to the process of mobilizing community members, facilitating, facilitating them to begin to realize their problems they face and help them through to come up with solutions using the community structures, community resources. Sorry, there's a sound. Somebody is opening um, somewhere. Um, solutions using the local resources available to address their needs. The process in this context has a number of facets which I, I want us to go through. And uh, these facets, number one, is promoting social solidarity through community self-reflection on common problems they actually face. This is the first point, is to look at so promoting solidarity, looking at the common problems that people face. Common problems will bring people together to deal with the problem. Promoting social solidarity in analyzing possible solutions to uh, the problems. Uh, promoting social solidarity in local resource awareness within the communities that people live. There are local resources that are available that they need to look at and uh, together that will bring them together. Uh, setting up a local structure like farmers club or farmers schools uh, where they learn advanced farming technologies and uh, of course a concept of management. Promoting social solidarity through corporate, corporate uh, partnership like uh, Invest and also Job for Development and other organizations. Um, I've just summed up that in that diagram, it's the same thing. And because of time, I may not go through all those, that component of uh, community mobilization process, solidarity, self-reflection on problems, and uh, also analyzing the solution, the problems, and also looking at the local resources that are available, and also setting up the structures which are there for sustainability and handling of issues. Now, let me break down promoting social solidarity through community self a reflection on common problems they face apart from communities uh, apart from communalities in race color and type of food they eat people in a community are likely to face identical challenges individuals may not sort out these types of needs on their own but they can easily address them when they come together the facilitator asked pro asks problems um, um, probing questions to dig common needs for instance, if they are already farmers, Facita digs out the problems uh, which are relating to farming, farming itself. When people find similar identity and realize one, 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 um, one another's capacities or capabilities, naturally they tend to form a common goal which acts as an attractive force uh, towards one another. Um, that's solidarity already. This brings out um, the importance of all. So everyone feels important uh, in this particular. Uh, when they come together. Promoting solidarity in um, analyzing uh, possible solutions to their problems. This allows the community members to analyze and categorize their needs according to their priorities. In, instead of looking at external support, they look at possible solutions among themselves. So external support comes as a complement, but then they begin to realize that they have got uh, resources, capabilities, that they can use to achieve a goal. Promoting social, so, uh, social solidarity in local resource awareness. Here they begin to talk about possible resources and still they find among, um, uh, with the possible, uh, possible resources and skills they find among themselves. They analyze what they can do on their own using local available resources. Most common uh, resource uh, resources communities need is land. However, in semi-urban land here in Malawi, uh, it's becoming scarce as most of the land is being sold out. But in most rural areas, land is available for most families, so each is encouraged to own their own plot. The other resource is people themselves with various skills. Some skills need to be developed and some skills need to be uh, uh, dig out people. The facilitator helps them through the process. I, I just want to share some of the pictures. That's one of the processes that we involved, bringing women together uh, through the CMP, community engagement meetings, just to dig, uh, look at their problems and find solutions, look at the sources and uh, uh, connect them to uh, uh, some corporate structures that can support them. So setting up a local structure, as already mentioned, uh, for management, setting up a local organization structure like a simple committee is key to ensure that communities own 
the program instead of just bringing issues but engaging the community this could be clubs or self-help groups or any other structure and of course uh, it also boosts social solidarity among themselves it boosts their esteem this establishes internal asset i mentioned in this case hope hope is an internal asset that which is within somebody that gives them a hope that they can change their lives to achieve eternal asset external asset visible evidence of an achieved goal for example if somebody has a land that uh, of course they have a lot of harvest that as is a visible um achieved um external asset the facilitator res uh, res uh, responsibly uh, responsibility is to ensue possibilities um and guide through the path to get to the desires to the desired outcome promoting social solidarity among corporate partnership at this level the facilitator begins to support the members to outsource other external resources which cannot be met by themselves and normally uh, this particular model looks at 90% uh, being contributed by the local local community members themselves and maybe 10% by external donors or supporters. This strategy ensures that there is no dependency syndrome. Where there is dependency syndrome, syndrome, there is no sustainability. So it fights against dependency syndrome um, and also that the program is sustained to withstand time. This is exactly, excuse me, this is, yes, this is exactly where invest and job for development have established their partnership the two corporate bodies with an intent to alleviate uh, suffering have built a social solidarity among community members and uh, between themselves i'll be through very shortly um, achievement so far invest and partnership with J jfd have over the past years initiated community farming projects in three districts in malawi uh, they have used projects to uh, create jobs to vulnerable community as they get paid out of peaceworks they do on the fields community farming uh, projects have helped build social solidarity and the field have uh, the fields have been used as uh, an inspiration where each participant in turn owns a field where they each year harvest their own produce to support their families uh, invest and job for development initially su uh, uh, supplying farm inputs to inspire farmers to own their own crop the harvest from the community field are sowed and reinvest in the next season to build financial muscle for uh, the organization and also the community members. Using the Joseph concept, the harvest is kept and uh, as uh, need arises, beneficiaries are able to get some to support their families during lean periods. Invest and job for development are continuously developing a best suitable model with uh, an updated knowledge research based practices and cost effect efficiency as to to address this um, uh, specifically identified needs in specific uh, cases thus i mentioned about children support uh, this child just called me two days ago saying please thank you so much for supporting me. i said what so for supporting me with tuition for supporting me with all my school needs she actually sat for msc the the senior examination at secondary high school and uh the entrepreneurship um, uh, training at uh, one of the local communities using a school structure. Um, and uh, this just a picture showing farm input distribution seeds on the left and also some fertilizers on the right uh, for the communal project and also for individual projects. Especially this is for women. And the chief on the right, the chief actually distributing seeds in one of the villages. And uh, that uh, shows the beneficiaries receiving some uh, fertilizers to apply in their fields. And the future plans intensifying crop production among individual farmers, as uh, our experience has been having a communal fields which have uh, been used uh, for demonstration. It is our hope that farmers get have um, uh, huge, will get huge yields in their fields. Animal farming is another area which Invest has initiated this year to start with goat railing. Uh, this is a pilot program. Uh, value addition, Invest looks forward to formation of cooperatives for farmers to begin to increase their produce um, uh, for greater returns, saving and uh, self-help groups to complement efforts on agriculture initiatives, strengthening already available partnership and exploring more partnership in similar interest. Uh, this will build a strong social solidarity at a local level as well. Um, let me mention that uh, 
in the in this initiative there will be always problems but what is key uh i may not mention some of the struggles that uh, we may go through in partnership solidarity building but what is very important is frequent meetings frequent basically is communication communication is what has helped us to move at the local level as well as at a uh, corporate level those are just contacts i'm through and uh, uh thank you so much for listening we may have some feedback and all that but thank you so much for listening uh, thank you Hello, sir. Yeah. Return or more solution, sir. Can you explain it in no time, sir? Sir, you're a brilliant, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, excuse me. Sir, can we raise questions? Yeah, thank you very much for the resource person. He has given the bird eye view of uh, development of agripreneurs. Uh, I have a doubt whether this JFD is uh, entertaining projects from the civil society organizations directly or they go through the process of networking or referencing from the previous organization, those who have their tie-up. Because certain organizations, funding organizations, they adopt the procedure of a referencing model. Just I want to know whether we can apply them on our own or we we'll have to have a referencing model. I just want to know whether, what is the procedure for approaching them? Hello? Ivan can take up that one. Uh, thank you so much for the question. I think Ivan will pick it up. Ivan? Yeah. Oh, okay. Can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, uh, Esther. And thank you, uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation, Timothy. And um, also, sorry for your presentation. Uh, it's a bit earlier in the morning in Norway, so I didn't get to listen to all the speakers, but um, I'm really glad to participate.
right, and uh, be a part of um, uh, organizing this event together with uh, these good friends of ours in um, Preya University in Tamil Nadu. Uh, so this is uh, this is the, I think it's the second event we held together. And uh, like speaking about solidarity, I think this is a really good uh, example of uh, solidarity works. Uh, we bring in different uh, perspectives from different countries. And um, we have students, we have academics, and we have uh, practitioners. Yeah. And uh, all together, I think we'll have a, we will have a, a good way forward. So uh, in terms of your question, um, I can just explain a bit how we started this work and uh, how we are operating. Um, uh, it, it starts with, uh, I think it starts with uh, an aim to, to we have a different... Sorry? Okay, C can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, I am ah, okay. hearing you. Okay. Um, no to your question. Um, I think we have a different uh, approach in our life. We have a different uh, task which is ahead of us. And uh, at least for uh, uh, the Jobs for Development organization, we are targeting uh, people struggling to find work. And we have seen if we can uh, assist people to get a stable income, or of course, sometimes maybe just a piece work, uh, it's more easy for them to provide for their needs themselves. Um, if they have a regular income, you know what's best for your families and for your own uh, future. Meaning, if you need, uh, you know, money for school fees, or you need the money maybe for construction works of your house, or uh, like basic needs of food and stuff, I think the individual know this best. So uh, we see that jobs is a good way to assist. So we have tried to work with local partners. In uh, we have a, a good partnership in India, and also uh, in Malawi and uh, Mali, where we try to assist local communities. Uh, where there is a risk in doing farming, you know much more of that in India and Malawi than uh, in Norway. But we also start to see climate changes in Norway. So we see that farmers, of course, they are in risk area, risk business. So what we try to do with our, uh, we are in a quite initial stage. We try to, to uh, take some of the risk of some of these uh, marginalized farmers. Meaning uh, if, if you have a harvest planting season, it's hard for them to, um, you know, if the harvest is not going well, the whole foundation can break. So we try to assist with uh, some practical things, maybe some rent of land for a longer period of time, some assisting for uh, seeds, fertilizers and these things. And even if the harvest is going bad, it's possible to keep the program going for a long term perspective. So I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm not sure if I got your full question, but the way we work is of course through local organizations, which already has equipment and already has uh, programs going on uh, in agriculture area. We see that's a really good uh, place to start because uh, agriculture is a universal and the most needed uh, field to develop. And the farmers, they have power, I feel, because they, they provide the most basic things we have in life, food. Meaning uh, it, will, uh, it will always be a crucial area, but it's also a place where it's uh, big risk, high volatility. Um, it's hard to get a fair price on markets, uh, you know, where the rich get richer. So uh, in this sense, I think uh, we have a common uh, solidarity uh, commitment to assist the one of us who are blessed in some ways we can assist and some others that have skills in other areas, they can assist people with other challenges. Um, yeah, so there are um, hopefully possibilities for the future to assist uh, in a longer perspective and in, in different areas also in India. It was a long answer to your question. Thank you, sir. We are a civil society organization working for uh, small farmers, especially okay. the women. Ah, oh, wonderful. Uh, in Trichy. Uh, we are working for the, uh, we work in, uh, we try to give them the alternative uh, livelihood programs for them also. Mm. 
the thing is mm-hmm. if we want to have a tie up with you or if we want to approach you uh, i just want to know what is the procedure of uh, approaching you sure thanks for uh, for your uh, it's wonderful to hear and it's inspiring to hear i guess uh, you have a bit similar work to timothy they are also working with uh, widows and uh, females ma- mainly at least some of the, one of the villages they are doing uh, we have a, we have a, you can contact mr the, the the organizer of this event mr namaraj he has a lot of uh, acti- I, I was in uh, this uh, wonderful campus back in 2013 and i met him and he has um, a l- l- huge commitment in many areas so uh, uh, i think he is a good uh, a spokesman uh, how to um, get the community at least we can start uh, you know a conversation i think it's always good uh, one can start to, to have a, a fellowship and then from then we can see what happens so if you can he he will he has the information needed thank good you, luck sir. with thank your you works sir. and i hope to hear more, hear more from it thank you sir thank yeah. you so much thank you very much Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Really, you have made this program wonderful, creating an international platform. Thank you.
Thank you and you're welcome. Thank you.
Hello. I want to see you now. Yeah. Hello.
Okay, thank you, thank you very much for the um, for the sharing for uh, from both of you, and um, it's uh, it's a learning experience for uh, 
uh, most of us also participating here. Uh, so I just want to like uh, to uh, also send my greetings and uh, passings from here. Um, especially thanks to uh, the organizers. Uh, Preya University has been the main organizer of this event. Uh, Jobs for Development has been assisting to, uh, to find some speakers and also some of the content of uh, this uh, symposium. Um, so my friends and uh, good partner, Mr. Nana Raj, uh, has been a main organizer and uh, also been communicating with uh, Dr. Anand Gerard, Sebastian. Uh, at the Department of Social Work, and um, it's always been a pleasure. This is the second time we organize an online workshop together. First time, I think it was about uh, maybe one, one or two speakers. Now we have uh, so many different speakers from different countries. And of course, uh, you are the main uh, force and drive in this um, this uh, work, but uh, I'm glad to assist and we also have, um, I think we have other good partners for the future and uh, connections here in Norway and also elsewhere, which can uh, collaborate in uh, future topics. So already we have been communicating with Mr. Nanaraj to plan maybe a session uh, in some months from now. Uh, so this has been a good opportunity also in this COVID-19 situation. We see possibilities to use uh, like internet and, uh, and Zoom to have uh, a communication. Uh, thank you for also the great effort from your university. I know that uh, this kind of initiative must be supported from the leadership. Uh, so I'm so glad that uh, you are positive to this kind of uh, uh, symposiums and uh, the way you have uh, been facilitating also. I'm sure it's been an easy way to uh, easy easy way to work for the the staff at your university. So a special thanks to uh, the heads and the staff of uh, Periyar Minimal uh, Institute, uh, both for your organization and recognition of this event. Um, I visited your camp back in 2013. Uh, and for me, it was an eye opener uh, to see how one can run a university campus, um, a structure like you have. Um, you have a high level of uh, theoretical and academical skills and knowledge, but you also have, uh, and at the same time, you have a good connection to practical needs and challenges for the local communities. Uh, of course, many times uh, universities, they have been um, blamed for too, they are too distant from the real challenges in our lives or in people's lives. And uh, it's, I think, um, I think it's, uh, it's a standard model when I went to see your place, and I've been speaking about this other places as well, that you managed to have a high level of competence and uh, a real touch on, the, on what's needed on the ground. Um, so I just want you to say I'm impressed by the work you have been doing. And just like you said, uh, the, the, the former president of yours, uh, who wrote uh, Feeding 3 Billion, I also remember I read this book some years back, he mentioned your university. And I think it's, a, it's an acknowledgement to your work and the way you think about uh, knowledge and uh, how this is needed for the local communities and the people struggling. Um, so I would also like to thank um, all the students and other participants. Um, I believe that most of uh, the speakers and the participants here, uh, we have the same desire to reach out to other people outside of our own lives. And we know the, the implications and the challenges, uh, each of us, I'm sure. There is, uh, there always is, uh, is uh, some uncomfort reaching out. We will face challenges, uh, and uh, particularly with the vulnerable children and vulnerable youth and also adults and older people and entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs that's been mentioning in this symposium. And uh, I feel that uh, without solidarity and without sticking together, we will not last in the long run in this kind of works. So uh, I think this uh, solidarity topic of this uh, solidarity working day, I think it's a good uh, reminder for us also in the coming time that we need to stick together. Uh, challenges are faced best when we work together. I think um, each of us can contribute on our individual with our individual possibilities and skills. But uh, altogether, we need each other's expertise and uh, energy 
uh, to reach out to as many people as possible. So I would also like to encourage all the students. Um, uh, you are ahead of uh, your long-term um, calling. I feel social life is a kind of calling. Um, and it's sometimes it's hard to find the, our path. It's hard to find, the, especially for many of you struggling to find a job, struggling to, um, with the financial issues. I would like to know that uh, at least uh, many of us, we want to uh, encourage you to, to see where your uh, life is directing. There's always people in need and out of that, there can also be possibilities for yourself. Um, so I would like to follow, encourage you to follow your calling. Some of you, you have a calling to reach out for disabled people. Some have a special calling for reaching out to older people. Some has a commitment to the poor people. And I think each of us, we need to follow that road. We don't know the direction always, and we don't know the, um, the end of it. But I really believe that uh, we cannot gather all, all of it at the same time, all of us. But uh, if each one of us follow our path in life, uh, we will have to, uh, big possibilities to reach out to many people. So even if you cannot see the full future, I would encourage you to take one step at a time and use your uh, professors and your staff members and your uh, student colleagues and uh, partners to assist you and find good uh, collaborative uh, communities and fellowships. Last but not least, I would like to thank the speakers um, for participating during the day. I've not been able to follow all of them, especially since it was night time when you started here in Oslo. Uh, now we have a full lockdown again in Oslo. So most shops are closed, schools are closing down. Um, and there is a challenging time here as well. Uh, so I would like to encourage you also in this phase to stay faithful and hopeful for the future. Um, so I would like to thank the speakers, and especially Mr. Timothy and Mr. Zimba, uh, Tim Timothy Zimba and Sori Ibrahima, which uh, I know personally, and I'm glad that they could join. And also uh, the other speakers, it was uh, so nice to hear you, and I would love to hear more from you again, uh, bringing different things to this uh, symposium. Um, yes, so I hope uh, we'll continue, and thank you for this uh, opportunity to share some of uh, our thoughts and our works. And I'm sure we'll continue our partnership in the future. Thank you. Mr. Anand, Gerard, you continue.
Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for, for those kind words. Um, your profile always sounds better when someone else reads it out to you. Um, yeah, yeah thank, thanks very much for the invite, and, uh, and I hope that the day has been um, you know, of, of use and value. I'm sure there's been a lot of good ideas shared. Um, so I've um, prepared a few slides just to kind of provide a backdrop to what I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to take a, a, a rather broad view um, of the broader topic around Ubuntu um, as a, a kind of philosophical source. Uh, so I'm going to endeavour uh, to share my screen with everyone. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you'll forgive me if uh, the tech doesn't quite work. Um, but I will do that just now. Um, So I hope you can see something, perhaps not as as, as clear as. Um, I hope everyone can see that. Um, okay, that, that, that's great. Um, I think the first thing I would want to say is that um, you know the IFSW, which everybody um, you know is obviously familiar with, have five themes for the next decade, um, and one of those um, is. Um, Ubuntu, I am because we are, and I'll I'll talk to that in a minute. But I suppose the the the, the five themes set something of an agenda um, for the IFSW and all of us involved in social work. Um, and what strikes me is that all those themes, um, whilst they're the agenda for the next ten years, are themes that have been evident um, and needing focus for many, many years. Um, so for me, there's always a, a thing that every year, you know, we celebrate World Social Work Day and rightly so. Um, but each year we seem to be faced with more difficulties. Um, and as a, as a global community, and, and for me, these arise and persist because of human frailty. Now, that's not human frailty in the sense of, you know, that we might normally think of it. Um, but the frailty, it seems to me, that's attendant within greed, selfishness, poor governance, and the kind of primacy that's given to economics over other aspects of human existence. And certainly in, um, well, in, in across the globe, but certainly um, in uh, Northern Europe and the USA, um, we experience that selfishness poor governance and, and, and reliance on, on the, the guiding force, some would say, of, of economics uh, under the terms of a, what I, I would see as a very pernicious ideology, and, and that being neoliberalism. And neoliberalism, I'm sure, is a, as we're all aware, is a, you know, I, I would say that's a global pandemic um, and something that we, we, we do need to consider in the context of, of what social work's about and how social work operates and importantly I think how social work is allowed to operate um, and what I find interesting is that um, when we look at the definition of an ideology it refers to a set of ideas underpinning and forming the basis for action so I find it strange in some respects that we have a that globally we've managed to turn the characteristics of selfish individualism into a coherent ideology that we've called neoliberalism, which is supported by and supports the role of economics and uses GDP as a measure of societal progress. And I think there's a, there's a point in that for me because um, the, the kind of underpinning theme around um, the, the, the conference today, around strengthening social solidarity and social work interventions is focused on um, a philosophy um, and the kind of 
core aspects of that, which I'm sure people have, are familiar with, um, are, are there. Um, and what I find somewhat strange is, and it's a question really to ask, yourself, ask ourselves, I think, that if we can turn selfish individualism into a coherent ideology, why can we not turn the characteristics of Ubuntu and other ethical systems into a coherent ideology? And it strikes me that perhaps the question, or rather the answer to that question is because such approaches are seen not to generate wealth, nor to share power or influence, at least as conceived um, by those people who have power and who have influence. So it strikes me that neoliberalism might see Ubuntu not as I am because we are, but I am because we are not. Um, and it's a very divisive um, ideology. Um, and I mentioned that, you know, in talking about Ubuntu, which its principles, um, you know, manifest and morph very readily into the core principles underpinning uh, social work practice. I'm sure we can all see that. Um, and in similar ways, um, other ethical systems that exist across the globe, likewise, um, you know, translate well into the only underpinning features um, within social work practice across across the globe. And, and here we have um, Aristotle's ethics. Um, and he referred to eudaimonia, which was he refers to as the highest human good. And that's about being happy uh, in that broad sense. And it strikes me that perhaps the main feature of social work is to facilitate people, um, you know, enjoying happiness and enjoying the good life. Um, and in a in a similar way, um, there are other approaches to ethic, ethics and values um, that underpin Ubuntu and, and other uh, systems, but take a more psychological approach. Um, and there's work by Peterson and Seligman. Um, people may well be familiar with Martin Seligman's work, he's, he's very much into um, um, positive psychology these days, uh, making a lot of money out of that. Uh, there's maybe a tension in there somewhere, but hey-ho. Um, uh, so there are lots of, there's lots of kind of work out there. There's lots of um, things that are, are going on in helping people to, to, to kind of pull together and make more coherent the underpinning values uh, around not just social work, but a range of, of, of human service professions. Um, so it strikes me that, that when we're talking uh, at this conference about what helps and what underpins and, and may well um, facilitate effective um, solidarity uh, and effective interventions that will change people's lives in meaningful ways, one of the things I think we need to recognise is that we already have across the globe a range of differing systems, all of which, it seems to me, contain the same principles, the same aspirations. And yet somewhere down the line, those haven't been coalesced um, into a system such that it takes precedence over other systems. And the other system I'm referring to is that of economics, the, the kind of petrodollar um, and neoliberalism. And I think one of the great challenges for social work is to recognise that other ideologies are, are far more um, um, virulent, shall we say, to, to, to use an apt phrase perhaps uh, in today's context. Um, and perhaps one of the, the celebrations within World Social Work Day is to recognise that as a profession, uh, and as a global community, uh, we need to come together to highlight the values and the action potential within all of these particular virtues, for want of a better phrase, um, that can do much to change people's lives. Um, and hopefully, you know, a more, some might say a more grandiose level, make the world a better place than it is now. Because one of the things that strikes me um, about the way in which 
because social work does operate within you know the the existing systems ac across the globe um, and as i'm sure we're all aware neoliberalism is, is global um but one of the things about neoliberalism we need to to take on board is that it kind of eschews into subjectivity um it doesn't uh, see much benefit um in terms of personal relationships at a human level it sees human relationships as being about economics similarly it doesn't see much role for empathy or compassion uh, <clears throat> and certainly has no no cut with social and economic justice and it seems to me that we need to translate the principles of ubuntu and other systems into a coherent system of action sorry action oriented goals at the local, the global, as we call it, and global levels, uh, uniting under the banner of universal human rights, social justice, and for me, a call for well-being uh, to be the measure of social progress, not GDP um, and the petrodollar. Um, and it strikes me that social work is very well placed to act to set the vanguard of that transformation because it possesses the ethical systems and the platform, the ethical platform from which to do this, but it doesn't possess the political platform. And it seems to me that, that you know, we have to recognize that social work cannot be apolitical. Um, but for many who sit within the higher reaches of, of our various governance structures, social work is very much a marginal activity that focuses on marginalized people. And I think unless and until uh, we take stock of the way in which we can utilize these broader principles um, as, a <clears throat> as a force uh, for good and a force for change, then social work will continue to do what it does, but it will continue to still have days like this that, yes, by all means, celebrate what we do, but we need to celebrate that you know, social work is uh, a force to be reckoned with in the sense of its underpinning values um, that, that strive um, to, to create a, a better sense of well-being for, for, for everyone. So it strikes me that the profession must focus its activities on transforming dominant ideologies that currently define our worldview. Uh, the economics and the free market will take it all in its stride and ultimately everyone will benefit now those who you know follow and, and and kind of believe in neoliberalism and see it as a force for good would 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 kind of you know argue very i'm sure very coherently uh, against me when i'm saying that neoliberalism isn't isn't the way to go uh, they would argue otherwise um but one of the things that we we, we must remember is that our values and practice must, must extend to challenge the dominant socio-political discourse. Um, as I said, you know, for me, social work is, is core and key to many people's lives. And I would much rather be in a world where there were social workers than in a world where there wasn't. Uh, I dread to think what that would look like. And at the very local level, our own individual actions are underpinned by our social work values and the IFSW and other organizations have articulated those very well. Um, and we must always adhere to those principles um, because they inhere within Ubuntu and um, other philosophical systems. And the profession must embrace and continue to embrace the centrality of human relationships. Now, I've got a couple of my colleagues from Ed Chill with with us today, uh, Dr. Selwyn Stanley, who uh, was kind enough to kind of nominate me, as it were, to 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 come and, and talk to you all, um, and another colleague of mine, Joanna Stathopoulos, um, and they will they will be very familiar um, with what I'm about to say. <clears throat> but I will I will say to students every single turn, um, such that students are probably absolutely sick to death of me saying this. But I'll say to them, if you cannot engage with another human being at some level the rest will not follow. So it doesn't matter how clever you are, it doesn't matter how much knowledge you have, it doesn't matter how many theories you understand, it doesn't matter how many interventions you know or have access to. If you cannot engage um, with people, it doesn't matter because relationships are the vehicle through which our interventions um, take place. 
Uh, and whether they're as effective as they might be, you know, that, 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 that's a different matter. But it all boils down to the nature and the quality of the relationships that you have with people. Um, so for me, it's that that underpins all that we have, because if we want to follow a path that's underpinned by and reflective of yeah, the lessons of Ubuntu or, or Aristotle's ethics or whatever it might be, again, once again, we see the relationship, yeah, that interpersonal relationship as being the vehicle through which those can be given effect or not. So it's, it's so important that we recognise what positive and effective human relationships look like. For me, they're not based on money. They're not based on what you can do for me and how you can benefit and I can benefit economically. It's about far more than that. So we should be proud not only of our heritage, but of all our efforts as social workers. I was looking at some of the kind of avatars and the, the wee signs there um, before, and I noticed there's a, some kind of street project. And, and I think the work that social workers do, however localised, however small scale it might appear to be, um, the outcome um, is making a difference. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, you know, if making a difference to one person is all that you do in that day or that week, then that's, that's a good thing. But we need to grow that. We need to expand that. We need to see that making a difference does count to people. I've been a social worker for a long time now. <clears throat> and I think I've made a difference to some people's lives. Um, I think some people's lives I've changed, and I'd like to think I've changed it for the better. And I don't say that in a grandiose way. I don't say that in a you know, to be, you know, impressive or anything like that. I say it because for me, making a difference to someone actually means something to me. Um, you know, for me, <clears throat> it's about feeling that you have done something that's worthwhile and that someone may benefit um, from what I've done with them, not to them necessarily, but with them. Yeah, uh, and Ubuntu will say, says, see yourself in other people and be self-aware. You know, it's really important that we do that. Um, so today isn't just about a celebration, because um, I guess there might be some people who say, well, what's to celebrate? Um, we've got a global pandemic. Um, we've got increasing levels of poverty. We've got, you know, more war going on now across the globe than we've ever had in the two world wars. Um, so you might think, well, what is to celebrate? Um, but actually, I think what's to celebrate is the fact that social work as a profession is still there and it's still pushing the boundaries and it still needs to do that and, and must continue to do that. So I think the celebration is about seeing all of us, what we do and what we aspire to do as a starting point for something bigger, better and more assured um, of its place. Um, in the global context. Um, social work, I would like to think, isn't going away. Um, I know that there are, you know, some views who would argue the contrary, um, and that's something that we need to be very mindful of. And that's why social work needs to be very clear about its purpose and about what it is attempting to change and how it's going about doing that. So a world with social workers might for some seem to be a world where bad things still happen, and that's the case. Of course, that's the case. But a world without social workers, I don't think, is even worth contemplating. So social work's about individuals, families, communities, but it's also about the structures and systems that frame our reality. Uh, and many of these have been designed with profit and power in mind and not people. So I'm, you know... I'm sitting here, I was going to say I'm standing here, I'm not, I'm sitting here several thousand miles away from all of you. Um, and I, I, you know, I can say hand on heart that I'm proud to be a social worker and I'm proud to say that I have made a difference. Um, but perhaps now as a profession, uh, as individuals and, and within that profession, perhaps now we need to be smarter um, and use what we all see as the guiding principles for a good life as tools of and for social change and I also think it's important that to remember that as social work educators we have a duty of care not just to our students but to the profession and the people um, within that um, 
the people that, that this profession serves and the people that we serve, um, because we're both public and global servants. Uh, and educators must endeavour to educate and train students so that they embody the core ethical principles referred to in Ubuntu and other philosophical systems and bring that philosophical reasoning to bear on the systemic change that we seek to produce. Um, now, one, one of the things, um, you know, about my, back, my kind of background and my interests is that I have a, a deep interest in philosophy. Uh, and that's not because I think philosophy is clever or anything like that. Um, but because I think philosophical thinking and philosophical reason and philosophical principles that have stood the test of time um, can do much uh, to help us to think more clearly about what we're doing and why we're doing things and the ways in which we do things. And can help us, I think, um, to be clearer in the, for the reasons why things need to change. Because, you know, we're, we've got, you know, many, many more problems probably on the planet now than we've ever had. You know, we've got pandemics and things and we've, thankfully we have the technology to be able to respond to those things. We've got climate change, as I said earlier, we've got poverty that's increasing exponentially. You know, we've got more wars, we've got violence to people left, right and centre. Um, so there, there are many more problems we have. And, you know, I think philosophically, you could argue that perhaps what's underpinning the reasoning or the reason for many of these difficulties is a lack of adherence to a common ethical framework, a, a common philosophical and ethical base that we all subscribe to. And it strikes me that the, the themes and the aspirations of the IFSW and its 10-year agenda are about bringing to bear and, and foregrounding um, philosophical thinking and philosophical and ethical principles that if we embrace and utilise those as, as forms of action, um, could make a significant difference. But that difference is predicated on systems of governance governments, whatever you want to call them, monarchies, whatever exists across the planet, similarly taking heed of the inherent humanism and humanity <coughs> that exists within these philosophies. Um, these are not just words. These are words to guide the way that we act and the way that we live. Um, because for me, it's, it's quite clear. I mean, for me, there's no equivocation about that. There are far more similarities between all of us than there are differences. Uh, and what differences do exist, whether that be in terms of culture, religion, beliefs, whatever it might be, that brings interest and vibrancy to our world and, <clears throat> and to all of us. And we should celebrate that and be thankful that that's there. We shouldn't condemn it. We shouldn't shoehorn that. We shouldn't try and shoehorn everything into making money. Um, so we must applaud those differences and support them. And for me, that's what part of what the agenda uh, from the IFSW is saying. And it strikes me that overall, um, one of the, the key um, issues uh, in terms of not just how we think about what we do, but how we do what we do is that integration is the key. And just coming back to one of my um, heroes, as it were, um, Nicholas Rescher, who writes as it says there, that philosophy seeks to bring rational order, um, intelligibility to the confusing diversity of our cognitive affairs. Thinking about the principles underpinning Ubuntu and other systems gives us an opportunity to reflect on what we do, how we do it, and why we do that. And I think social work as a profession, and the IFSW in particular, has a key role in communicating those messages to those people who currently hold power. Because by virtue of them currently holding power, they're in a position to utilise that influence to change things so that we can go down a different path. This isn't the only path that there is. Um, and for those who think it is, I think we need to look behind us and to see what detritus we're leaving behind. There's a lot of misery, there's a lot of pain in the world, 
Um, and social work can't change all of that. That's beyond the scope of, of I think, any one profession or range of professions. But the systems that and the, the, the kind of mechanisms, the ideologies that frame and make up our social reality need to be challenged by reference to a coherent and solid set of ethical principles, which everyone buys into. And on the basis of that, the hope is then that behaviours begin to change and actions that support the achievement of what Aristotle would refer to as eudaimonia and the greatest good will be achieved. And I think social work is well placed to take the lead in that. And hopefully all of us can celebrate the fact that we appreciate the significance and importance of having clear and meaningful um, ethical principles to guide what we do. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, and thank you, and thank you for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, thank